Test, 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 test one, test two. Good. Welcome to this hearing of the City Council's Committee on Transportation. I am Danis Rodriguez, the chair of this committee. Today the committee will be conducting an oversight hearing on the plan to fix the New York City's mass transit system, the plan fast forward. I gotta say my first meeting with Andy Byfin was very impressive to understand that he know the frustration of riders visitors and his commitment to the only assignment that I signed to do here is to fix our train system in New York City. So I personally took his word. I know that that day he took the A train to 177 and walked to my office at 177 in Wasford and he was not someone that came with anything more than I have experience, I had done it before and I committed to do here, to do here in New York City. So for me as a New Yorker, as a father or two daughter, 5 and 11, I want to leave a legacy to that generation that New York City can be that city that not only has a one trillion value transportation system, one of the, lar the largest one in the nation, the one that is run 24 hours, but the one that should be defined by being efficient and safe. Early this year, under the leadership of Andy Byfen, the MTA released the fast forward plan to modernize New York City transit. The plan lays out the 10 year timeline to modernize the system, modernize the system by upgrading signals, making more station accessible, and increasing transparency in the agency's communications with customers. The overall goal of the plan should be, as it's been described, to improve the performance and reliability of the system. Jumping into the train should be the best experience for the 8.5 million New Yorkers and the 65 million tourists that come here. This plan, however, will not come cheap, it will require funding. When it was first released earlier this year, estimate page the cost of the plan at approximately 19 billion. Recent estimates have put the overall cost at approximately 40 billion. Again, recent estimates have put the overall cost of, the, of this plan uh, approximately 40 billion. I believe that we lift, not necessarily the new leadership of the MTA, at least in the New York City Transit, how the Second Avenue started with 4 billion and ended with double that amount. We cannot repeat that. And we need to be sure that 
at the end of the day, when the plan is adopted, it should be focused on real dollars with real plan, not only using two companies to do most of the work, but to look for the 10 companies that we have worldwide that they are capable to do projects on time, and the focus should be only maintenance and repair. That's a lot of money, but it is the result of decades of mismanagement and lack of infrastructure funding from previous administrations. I always say that sometimes we criticize Latin America on how third world country misuse funding. But when I, in my year as an immigrant that I am, been here only for, since 1983, but more than 35, for more than 35 years, I can compare and I can now understand how we are so expensive to build, how we mismanagement, we're doing some mismanagement of so much funding in the past decade. So the time came, New York expects more, and the new leadership, they know that, they, that we need to respond to that frustration. I remember the days when the trains were covered by graffiti and it was really unsafe to ride the subways. Of course, the one train, most of the time, no heat, no air conditioning. When thousands and thousands of hardworking individuals, they needed to go to work. Yet we were able to turn both those situations around with, with power, determination, and creativity. I believe we can do the same today with the problem that currently ail the transit system. Since the release of the fast forward plan, there have been a couple of developments that have alarmed me. The first one was that the MTA announced a potential fare increase. I say loud and clear, not fare increase. Working class and middle class cannot afford and the additional tax. And that's what a fair hike means for hardworking and middle class New Yorkers. We need to focus on another revenue, another source of revenue. By a fair hike should be, must be out of the table. On the one other options, the base fare for a single ride could go up to $3 from the current 2.75, a weekly metro car could go up to $33, and a monthly pass could increase to up to $127 from the current $121. That's a big increase for working class. Probably doesn't mean anyone, anything for a millionaire, but for someone who rely on the minimum wage, this is a lot. And we had opportunity to look for the sources in another way. The other alarming development was that the MTA indicated that even with the plan increase that I just mentioned, they will have significant budget shortfalls over the next several years that may result in steep service cuts. We cannot go backward. We cannot think that riders will support any cut that are so essential for them to go to work or go to school or go to a medical appointment. The New York State Controller's Office recently indicated in one of the reports that the MTA is planning budget reduction of 539 million in 2019 with 489 positions already targeted for elimination. The report also indicated that the MTA faced a project operating budget gap of 634 million in 2022. That's why we need to be creative and think outside the box to explore additional stream or re revenue that may make our transit system better. Real estate own a lot of property. They have so much other way of how they also can reduce costs like tolling all the vehicles and also entering Manhattan's businesses district and design, designating that revenue 
which is estimated at more than one billion annually to the MTA. But also, it cannot be the congestion plan or the millionaire. It must be both. When the state go back in section in January, I hope that the blue wave that make the state, the state Senate Democrat majority, they should take as a number one priority to work with both initiatives, congestion plan and the millionaire taxes. If we do that, then we don't have to go for another fair increase. It is my hope that during today's hearing, we will get the latest update from New York City Transit and their fast forward plan. I also hope to hear additional ideas on what step we can take here in the city to improve the transit system and increase the revenue that can be used by the MTA to make those necessary investments. I support for the city to increase the contribution to the MTA as a state should do the same thing if those resources are going to be used only for mending and repair and if the MTA put the best plan ever to control the cost. With that, I also would like to acknowledge that we are here with our good friend, Assemblymember Blake, who is also sitting in the audience there too. Thank you for your service at, at, for your service at the Assembly. At this time, I would like to be to welcome the representative of the MTA that are here with us today and will comprise our first panel. Uh, but first, let me acknowledge my colleagues who are here, Councilmember Diaz, Richard, Koo, and Ross. And now I will ask the committee council to administer the affirmation and then invite uh, the MTA panel to deliver your statements. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee? and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, I'm very encouraged, uh, A, that you have invited us here today. I think that sends a strong message of the intent of city council to bite the bullet and do what's necessary to modernize transit in this city in conjunction with the state and other partners. Uh, but I'm also encouraged by your, um, your belief or initial belief in me from what we've, uh, what we've discussed so far, uh, because uh, I, I, I certainly don't intend to, to let you down in terms to that initial impression that I've certainly come here uh, with a view to a modernizing transit, and that's what I intend to impart in the next few minutes as I take you through a presentation. Um, so I appreciate that some of you have seen this before, but there are elements that are uh, updated. So I will go through it reasonably quickly because obviously the whole point is that you uh, get the chance to ask questions of us. But I think we all understand the context. Back in 2017, the governor rightly put the uh, MTA into a state of emergency as a result of a number of very high profile incidents and a, a decline, a long term decline in the reliability of the system uh, that culminated in those uh, very high profile uh, uh, incidents. At that time, I was the CEO, the chief executive of the Toronto Transit Commission, um, and I actually served on the panel or, or appeared on the panel for the, uh, that preceded the Genius Challenge. Uh, so I was present when the state of emergency was announced. I knew that I was in the running for this position, but it didn't faze me because I, I've, in 30 years of transit, I've always been attracted to challenges. The, the challenge doesn't come any bigger than New York, and this is a city that I've loved since the first time I uh, came here in 1994, on honeymoon actually. Uh, it's a wonderful place, it's somewhere I've always wanted to live, and this is the job to which I always aspired, uh, the, the biggest, toughest job in world transit right now. But I certainly don't underestimate it. Uh, and I recall very clearly arriving into this position on January the 17th of this year, uh, and I thought very carefully about what I would say, uh, and uh, having done my due diligence, I, what I said was the following, that the, the challenge really wasn't tinkering with the system, 
It wasn't that it needed to be tweaked, a few improvements here and there. What was needed was a top to bottom modernization of New York City Transit in every uh, aspect of its operation, its customer service, its prevailing culture, its infrastructure, and its processes. Uh, and that we needed to focus on four things, and those I will outline in this presentation. We needed to transform the subway, and by doing that, we need to bite the bullet and completely re-signal the subway to provide exponentially greater reliability and to provide more capacity. We need to get people back riding the buses because there's been a precipitous decline in uh, bus ridership uh, driven largely by alternative um, forms of transit, but also by the fact that the, the streets are so congested. The third um, element, I think the people would have predicted that I'd have said the first two. The third element, I think, caught some people by surprise. I feel very strongly that we should push on to make the subway as um, fully accessible in as short a time frame as possible. And the fourth element, which is kind of my signature piece, it's the glue that holds everything together. Anyone can modernize a transit system, but to make it truly world class, you also have to have the right culture the right accountability and the right uh, transparency and the right processes. So there needed to be that fourth element. And again, I will talk about those in, in turn. Um, but certainly, uh, I would say that at the moment, we're still in that state of emergency. Uh, we still have more to do. Uh, and every day, the system literally gets older. The infrastructure gets older. The pressure on the system increases. So the need to bite the bullet and to deliver this plan becomes ever more compelling. When I arrived, the subway action plan was already underway. That was uh, instituted by former Chair Joe, uh, Joe Lota back in the summer of uh, 2017. And the subway action plan, which is part funded, uh, jointly funded by both the city and the state, and we're very grateful for the city to, uh, for coming forward with its contribution to the, uh, to the uh, funding effort has largely focused and rightly focused on stabilizing the system. In other words, arresting that precipitous decline in subway reliability uh, and addressing largely infrastructure issues. So you can see on the screen there some of the statistics. I won't read them all out, but we have been um, fixing leaks. We have been uh, tightening up uh, on the way we manage track defects, fix fixing signal defects, maintaining our cars in a more reliable fashion, all with a view to not only arresting that decline in, in uh, reliability and punctuality, but in turning the corner. And the good news is that that focus on, uh, on infrastructure is bearing fruit. So you'll see from the performance trends in the middle of the uh, slide before you that major incidents are down by more than one third since the subway action plan was initiated. Major incidents, definition being incidents that delay 50 trains or more. Uh, on-time performance, back in October, we announced that on-time performance had hit a three-year record high. That's for weekday performance. For weekend performance, it actually hit a four-year high. Uh, I set my team a target, somewhat an arbitrary target, but it was deliberate, it was provocative. I set my team a target of cutting the number of delay incidents by 10,000 every month uh, by the year end, by the end of this year. For the third month in a row, we have beaten that target. And so monthly delays are trending down. Uh, in addition to Subway Action Plan, which largely focused on what I would call um, fixing things, uh, we've also instituted a real back to basics campaign where we are looking at the, the, the basics of running a subway, things that I've learned over 30 years of working in subways in London, on British Rail, in Railcorp in Sydney, Australia, in the uh, Toronto Transit Commission and now here. And that is making sure that you get your dwell times right, in other words, the time spent in stations, in getting to the root cause of delays and not focusing on uh, euphemisms like customer overcrowding. That overcrowding is the, is the result, not the, the root cause. So we've been really focusing on root cause. In addressing why the signal system uh, has less capacity than it used to have. So we've been progressively taking out unnecessary speed restrictions. We've run a, 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 a campaign called Save Safe Seconds, and that is what has driven the reduction in delay incidents. When we're most certainly still prioritizing safety, but I don't think that speed and safety are incompatible. 
In addition to all of that, we've also focused on the customer experience. And I should have said in starting that to my left here, to your right, is my chief customer officer, Sarah Meyer. And to my right is Tim, uh, Tim Mulligan, who's our senior vice president for operations support. And Sarah's job is to advocate for our customers. Her job is to stick up for the customers and to drive forward elements of customer experience. So more on that to follow. So that was the subway action plan. But what I did know uh, in arriving here, again, back to my earlier point, it wasn't about tweaking things. It wasn't just about the subway action plan. The subway action plan is good in that it, it maintains, it, it, it uh, arrests the decline, uh, and it gets back to where we can be within the limitations of current infrastructure. And that's the key point. It can only do uh, as, as, as best as uh, the current infrastructure allows. It only allows us to go so far in terms of improving New Yorkers' experience. What's really needed isn't maintaining the status quo. It's pushing on and completely modernizing this system in as short a time frame as possible. And for that, we needed a plan. And this is that plan, the fast forward plan. People said to me when I first got here, well, one of the problems with the MTA is uh, you don't really have a plan. You talk about the need to improve, but there's no plan. There's a budget, but there isn't a plan. Well, we now do have that plan. That plan was put together within 100 working days of us coming together as a new senior team. And it is a comprehensive plan. It is a, it's an ambitious plan. And it, within, a remar within a record time scale, it can deliver world-class transit to this city. So what does it do? It completely modernizes New York City transit from top to bottom in every aspect. Obviously, it does what you'd expect it to do. It overhauls the infrastructure, and I will come on to talk about that momentarily. But in addition to improving the infrastructure, which to me is only a third of the challenge, it also overhauls our processes, uh, which talks directly, Mr. Chairman, to your point about you need to see that our processes are indeed overhauled, that we are more transparent, that we can be trusted to spend the money that you uh, give us, that we can be trusted uh, to be transparent and, uh, and um, uh, crystal clear in everything that we do and, and upfront with our customers and our stakeholders but also that we overhaul existing culture so that you truly feel valued as customers when you ride the system. So my, my mantra has always been that to modernize a transit system, it's about people, it's about processes, and it's about culture. You need to do all three. So let's cut to the chase then. In the first five years of Fast Forward, subject to funding, uh, we will be able to uh, modernized sig the signaling system. The single most transformative thing that we can do for this subway is to trans is to re-signal it, to, to provide completely modernized signaling. And where not so long ago, and, and I'll come on to this point in further detail, someone made the point that if we continue to just uh, re-signal one line at a time, and each line takes about seven years. If you do the math, it's gonna take about 40 to 50 years, which is ridiculous. So we've revisited the way that we, uh, we would re-signal, and we're saying that within five years, subject to funding, we can modernize the signaling on another five, year, uh, another five lines. Uh, we would uh, really push along with modernizing our fleet, new subway cars, new buses, we would uh, make more than 50 uh, additional stations accessible, and that is a doubling of the current rate. We're doing around 25 at the moment, so we would double that to 50. We would redesign all of the bus routes in all five boroughs. We've uh, redesigned the express bus network in Staten Island, and um, Council Member Rose and I were uh, hearing last night where we heard much about that. But we will push on and redesign all 321 bus routes in within three years. We'd introduce a new fare payment system, no more MetroCard, a modern uh, fit-for-purpose uh, smart card system whereby you tap and go. And we would introduce more buses. Yes. I wanted to interject now. No. It's, not my, it's not a plan to stop for you to finish, but looking at this number right now, and I know that the signal system is one of the top priorities that we both understand mm -hmm. that has to be done. So what, how many cars should be upgraded with the signal system? And, and this number, how can we compare that 1,200 to whatever total 
Okay. If you, if you let me just go a couple more slides, I'll answer that question, because at the moment we have two lines on CBTC. This is equipping cars to, to, to uh, accommodate CBTC, communications-based train control, within five years. Just bear with me. So just setting the high-level scene a bit further, within the following five years, I'm sorry, within the following five years, another six lines on modern signaling for a total of 11 over the 10 years. Another 130 stations made accessible, and that's 180 stations over the 10 years. Um, another 150 stations completely renovated. So that plus the 150 in the first five years is 300 stations completely modernized within uh, the 10 years. And by modernized, I'm not talking about aesthetics. I'm not talking about cosmetics. I'm talking about fundamental rebuilds of stations to make them modern, to make them pleasant and safe and fit for purpose for the next 50 to 100 years. Another 3,000 new subway cars, another 2,100 brand new buses. Um, so let's talk about signaling then, and I can now answer your question, Mr. Chairman, in the next few slides. So the, as again, I reiterate, the single most transformative thing that we can do to transform the subway uh, itself and the subway riders' experience is to re-signal the subway. Yes, we need new track, we're working on that. We need to maintain the drainage, we need to maintain stations, we need to maintain pumps and all the various other things that you need to make a subway work. But the thing that's holding us back is the signaling system, because the signaling system uh, as, it, as it stands is safe, but it's very, it's very constrained in the number of trains that you can run, and it's very constrained in terms of its inherent reliability, because it's now in, in some places nearly 100 years old. We have signal frames that are nearly 100 years old. That is unprecedented. So we need to bite the bullet. So, uh, we have reorganized the way that we're going to re-signal this subway. If you recall, I said that doing the current math, it would take about 50 to 60 years. When I came in, I said to my team, why? Let's start afresh. Let's, let's look at this uh, in a fresh perspective. Work on new assumptions. Assume you can do more than one line at once. Assume that you will get uh, multiple weekend closures in order to undertake the work. Minimize the amount of customization of the product. The more you fiddle and, and um, the more you uh, customize a product, uh, the signaling product, the more risk you introduce, the more time you introduce, and the more cost you introduce. As, uh, minimize the interfaces between the signaling system and the cars. Keep it simple. And also, don't just focus on the state of good repair which was the, the running order in which we were doing the line, so doing the oldest ones first. Also, we should look to address those with the greatest need for additional capacity. So that's what we're going to do. So this diagram shows you the current um, number of lines with CBTC, and it's very up to date because we just this week, or last week actually, uh, we just completed the uh, initial um, installation of CBTC onto the seven line. We already had it on the L line, the Canarsi line. The flushing line, number seven, the purple line up there, has just, we just finished the final rollout, the final cutover of CBTC on that line. We still have some uh, further software upgrades to do, uh, but that's now two lines on modern signaling. So to your question, we currently have enough cars CBTC equipped to operate those two lines. What we also need is more power on the L line to run the full number of trains to, to the full capacity of that signaling system. So one of the upsides of the upcoming tunnel closure uh, for, the, uh, for the L line between uh, Brooklyn and Manhattan, one of the upsides is we will be increasing the number of substations so that we can run more trains. But the, the as-is situation today is that there are 900,000 daily customers on CBTC lines. If you keep an eye on the map, within five years, this is what the map could look like. And that takes us up to now three million daily riders, uh, daily customers on CBTC lines. And what you'll see in there 
um, is uh, a number of the very uh, uh, heavily used lines. So the four, five, and six, uh, which you can see there in the middle of Manhattan, uh, 149th Street, Grand, Course, Grand Concourse to Nevin Street, uh, we can have that upgraded to CBTC. The core trunk section of the Lexington line can be upgraded within that first five years. Plus, as you've seen, elements of the E, F, M, and R lines, the F line, the A, C, and the E, and the G line. Colleagues around the world have already said to me, are you sure you can do that? That is unprecedented. So I do want you to understand that we are really pushing the boundary here. But we believe that that is, uh, that is achievable. We can do that within five years. If you watch the map, this is what can be achieved within the second five years for a cumulative total of 10. So we've now moved from 900,000 riders a day to five million daily riders on modern signaling out of a total of 5.7 million. So that's 90% of customers of the New York City subway would be on modern signaling. So two further points to make. You may well be sitting there thinking, well, hang on a minute, what about, those, what, what about the other sections of line? Well, again, I reiterate that uh, there's a science behind the way we've chosen the lines. It's based upon an amalgam of state of good repair, how old the existing system is, and also the greatest need in terms of capacity. So those, those bits that aren't shown on this map are either in a better state of good repair, they're more modern, or they have less capacity constraints and they would be addressed in the, in the third tranche of five years so that within 15 years the entire net subway was remodeled. However, here's the good news. It's possible that we could re-signal the whole subway more quickly, more cheaply, and less intrusively if, as I think is increasingly likely, an emerging technology called ultra-wideband does prove to be safe and viable. And when I first heard about ultra-wideband, I was somewhat skeptical because it seemed too good to be true. You don't need to do so much work on the cars. You don't need to put so much equipment in the tunnel. And therefore, it's quicker, cheaper, and less intrusive to install the equipment. So contained within my plan, although the plan is predicated on known technology, and it has to be, we have to go with what is known and, and proven from a safety perspective right now. If ultra-wideband does prove to be viable, then we can reduce the cost and we can get this, the, uh, the lines re-signaled more quickly and with way less weekend interruptions. So that's good news. So we're, we're following a, a parallel path of progressing with CBTC whilst actively working with two suppliers to see if ultra-wideband is indeed a viable alternative technology. It's not all about re-signaling. Um, transforming the subway is also about getting exponentially better at the basics, and I've largely covered these points. So the fact that uh, reliability is turning the corner, we, are, we have now just hit three months in a row of reduced subway delay incidents. We have a much better handle of root cause of um, uh, of the, those incidents so that we tackle the right things and we, we, we assign the appropriate remedies. We're completing work more quickly does mean that progressively my job, our job as a team, is day by day to make things better. So what have we done so far? This is progress for 2018. We've introduced you talk about accountability. If you go to any subway station today, you will see a poster up on the wall which went up within the last two months with a photograph of the group station manager. It's a job I used to do. It's a job I did in London. I was the group station manager for King's Cross Station, the busiest tube station in London. And it is a, it's, a, it's a role that assigns around 20 stations to 22 different group station managers so that you as council members have a one-stop shop for what goes on in your community. Just talk to your local group station manager. They are responsible for two, uh, two angles or two lines of work to make sure that we uh, deliver excellent customer service through the uh, customer-facing employees and that we drive up the appearance and the maintenance and the cleanliness of the stations under their remit. So what have they been up to? Already we have deep cleaned 15 stations. We are having a blitz on customer restrooms and we have uh, improved the facilities at six stations so far, more to come. 
Uh, we have been making repairs at over 25 of our most problematic switches. Again, going back to root cause, you should look on a pro rata basis on a, um, uh, what's the expression, the, a, um, uh, um, there's a, there's a, a, a way of looking at this, a Pareto basis, sorry, a Pareto basis where you look at which are your worst performers and you assign the uh, corrective actions at the worst performers, which are the most impactful switches and which are the ones that cause you the most problems. So we, we, we now assign what's called Pareto analysis to make sure that we do that properly. We have corrected, uh, made signal modifications to those signals that weren't working properly and that uh, unnecessarily delayed customers. So we've just increased the speed on a number of lines. Uh, and we've also made some operational changes to safely speed up service. So that's subways, buses. Uh, the second of the four priorities that I announced, I've already mentioned that we will redesign the bus network in all th uh, three of all five boroughs over the next three years. We're working very closely with the city to, um, and the NYPD to improve traffic enforcement. Existing bus lanes far too often, I use buses regularly, far too often are blocked by um, deli people delivering stuff, by people double parking, by people dropping other people off. Um, bus lanes are there for a reason. Obviously, we've got to help businesses uh, do, uh, thrive, but the bus lanes must be kept clear if our buses are to have a fighting chance of getting through traffic. In addition, working with our colleagues at the DOT, installing more traffic signal priority equipment on traffic lights so that it gives buses priority getting through key intersections. We've announced that once the smart card is installed, we will speed up boarding by, by allowing rear door boarding. There wasn't going to be readers on the back doors, which is ridiculous. So we've instituted a change and said there must be readers installed on the back doors for no additional cost. Uh, we can accommodate that within the budget um, so that once smart card is available, you can legitimately board at the back. Uh, we're having uh, co targeted action on corridors to look at wh where the delays are happening to bus routes. Uh, on, and typically, it's not the whole route. There tends to be bottlenecks on the route, so we're addressing those. And we're pushing on towards an all-electric fleet as quickly as we possibly can once the technology is proven. Again, progress already. I've touched on some of this. I'm very grateful to NYPD for the work that they've done with us to date on targeting improvements on specific uh, 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 bus routes. Uh, we've relaunched or redesigned the Staten Island Bus Express Network, and that's still very much a work in progress. Some people love it. Some people aren't so happy. So we're continuing to make changes to that. Um, to that network. We've kicked off the Bronx uh, bus uh, network redesign, and that's the first of the uh, major borough redesigns. We've done the express network for Staten Island. We'll come back and do the local, um, local network later. We've expanded off peak service on five routes. Uh, we are continuing to do the uh, traffic signal priority upgrades on particular uh, bus routes across the city um, and uh, pushing on making sure that uh, priority routes are improved across the whole city, not just in particular boroughs. Accessibility. This was the third of the uh, four priorities. Um, it is just plain wrong that our subway system is not fully accessible. We must address that as a city. It's an equity issue. Uh, it's something I feel very strongly about. Right now, we have 119 accessible stations in itself that sounds like quite a lot. And if you compare it to other networks, it's probably the most uh, in terms of quantum. But we have 472 stations. And so therefore, the actual percentage is nowhere near so impressive. It's only around 25%. And that's simply not acceptable. However, with targeted action, we can, within five years, get to a position where you are no more than two stops away from an accessible station. No more than two stops away from an accessible station within just five years. How do we do that? By scientifically infilling gaps. So we look at demographics, we look at where there are gaps in the accessible network, and we look at key interchange stations and, we, and, and consult with the accessible community to make sure that we, uh, we do the right stations. What else are we doing? Uh, we want to see more direct accessor ride routes. The, at the moment, a, a regular complaint from accessor ride riders is that you, you get taken on a very circuitous route around the boroughs. So we're, we're redesigning the network to give you more direct routes. We've launched an app so that you can know where your ride is when it's coming. 
and we are providing sensitivity training to all 50,000 employees of New York City Transit, including executives. Let's have another look at a map. These, this is, these blobs represent where the current stations are, the existing stations, uh, 119. And as you can see, there are huge gaps in the network. Please watch the map. Within just five years, and this is indicative, this isn't saying where they will go, but it's to prove a point of what the network could look like. This is what the network could look like within five years with an additional 50. As you see, the, the, the blobs have increased. And that would take you to no more than two stops away from an accessible station, which is light years from where we currently are. If you keep watching the map, this is what we could have within just 10 years with another 130 which means we will be within striking distance of a fully accessible uh, network, and rightly so. What have we done to date? Uh, in a first for the MTA, we have a, a full-time accessibility advisor, a guy called Alex Elagudin, who used to be the TLC accessible, uh, accessibility advisor himself, a wheelchair user, where Sarah represents the customer, Alex represents the accessibility uh, or the disabled community. Uh, and he has in already initiated a raft of activity. We've been undertaking uh, surveys of all the remaining inaccessible stations to identify what the cost would be to update them, uh, to upgrade them, to, to make them accessible, and how complex that would be. We've been working on the existing system, providing better static signage at the stations, providing better uh, information, e-information, information on your phone so that you know if an elevator's not working and what your alternatives are. We've been um, pushing ahead on making the existing elevators work more effectively, keeping them in service and keeping them clean. Uh, and we've been pushing on with, uh, the ex with the design of new stations as part of our existing capital program. Nearly done. Finally, the fourth of the, f of the four priorities. Uh, the glue that holds this all together is to engage and empower our employees. There's 50,000 of us. I think the staff that work at Transit are fabulous. I've been very impressed with the employees that uh, I now work with. Uh, but I've been equally uh, determined that we should all up our game. Every single one of us needs to up our game to provide consistently excellent customer service that is worthy of the, um, of the, of the service that we should provide to New Yorkers. So we've reorganized the executive. It's very important that we have a structure with the right people in the right jobs, with the right skill sets and the right mandates. We equally uh, are paying great attention to show the employees that we value them. I believe that a happy workforce gets things done. I don't believe in coercion. I don't believe in big stick management. It might achieve things in the short term, but we're revising the way we, uh, we provide uh, discipline to be more corrective rather than punitive. Uh, we're listening to our employees in terms of um, get, getting their ideas and getting them to innovate. Uh, and we're also pushing on with uh, in, uh, ex 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 accelerating our approaches to diversity and inclusion. There are three themes that run through the whole plan, and you touched upon one in your intro. You will not trust us with the money that we're seeking for Fast Forward if we do things the way we've already, always done them. And we get that. We have to change the way we do things. And that's not just for New York City Transit, it's for the whole of the MTA. So we've already taken steps to, uh, to make ourselves more accountable. We've launched a number of new dashboards. Certainly for New York City Transit, we have revised our actual board pack that gets seen publicly uh, every, uh, every f uh, month. Uh, we're overhauling, under the leadership of Pat Foy, the president of the MTA, we're overhauling our processes to make ourselves more efficient. We're streamlining procurement to attract more businesses, more uh, delivery partners to come and work with us. We're addressing uh, the need, uh, needs of innovation, setting up an innovation unit so that we get more companies wanting to work with us and adopting best practice from across the world. And we've introduced new dashboards so that you, the uh, stakeholders and the, uh, the public representatives can see what we're doing. Safety, security, resiliency, obviously absolutely critical. It's not an initiative. It runs throughout the whole program. Uh, working with NYPD, in addition to the group station manager programs, we now have neighborhood community officers at each of our stations, and those people's uh, contact details are, again, up at the stations next to the group station managers. We've launched a safety hotline. 
uh, we, have, uh, we continue to do work post Superstorm Sandy to make our system more reliable, and we are increasing our uh, focus on sustainable practices to make ourselves more environmentally friendly. Uh, four more slides. Under Sarah's leadership, uh, we have an ongoing theme, it's not an initiative, of excelling at customer service. So, um, we, ha we have increased the amount of customer service th that we're, uh, training that we're doing. We've increased the number of uh, people at the Rail Control Center who put out real-time information on via social media. We have been increasing the amount of uh, announcements that we made both, both on trains and stations and improving employ uh, uh, community engagement through the deployment of group station managers. So again, a uh, quick update on progress. We're not holding back. A lot of, a lot of uh, what needs to be done, we can do right now. Sarah is appointed. We launched a MyMTA map, uh, app sorry, so that you can see real time what's happening on, your, uh, on the transit system. We've reduced the Metro card claim processing times by 70%. It used to be something like 21 days to get, a, uh, to get your um, claim processed. It's now seven days. We've launched a customer commitment and uh, consistent with what we said about improving information, remarkably, around 70 stations didn't have, uh, didn't have public address facilities at all. So we have uh, progressively begun installing though, that equipment in those stations that don't currently have it. So this would be my summary. We're at a crossroads. Uh, we could stop. We could uh, continue doing what we're doing in terms of the subway action plan. Things would definitely get better, but they would be held back within the limitations of the current capital plan and the, the limitations of the current signaling system. So yes, things would be better, they would be stabilized, but they would be nowhere near the world-class system that New York really needs. Or we can adopt the fast-forward plan. As the chairman said, it comes at a cost, but my view would be um, the, the real cost is not to bite the bullet. If we don't bite the bullet, the infrastructure will only get older. The pressure on it will only get uh, more intense as New York grows and the population increases. And the cost of it, because it, the need won't go away, the cost will only get higher. But if we bite the bullet, we have the opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to move from a state of emergency to state-of-the-art transit within 10 years, which, put another way, is less than 4,000 days. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you to your team for <clears throat> how helpful also you were doing the transit tour that we did, and, and everyone from our regional team and the whole team, that you were very helpful as we had spent 24 hours in the trains a few months ago listening from the riders. I, I got a few questions by my colleague, one of them they got to leave, and I'm going to give him the opportunity first, and then I get back into my own question. Councilmember Diaz. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Sir. Good morning. Okay, may I, let, me, let me ask you a question. Who is your boss? My boss is the managing director of the MTA, Ronnie Haken. And who is responsible as a whole for the, in right now? I'm sorry. Could who's you? responsible right now? I mean, who's the big boss? Uh, well, ultimately, uh, the way I look at it, it's not meant to be a glib answer, but ultimately New Yorkers are my boss because I've come here to, to transform transit. But on a purely hierarchical basis, my boss is the managing director of the MTA. Uh, ultimately, the chairman of, of the MTA and the board uh, set the direction for me. Let, me. let me let me see if you could understand what I'm trying to, to get here. On June 29, 2017, Governor Andrew Cuomo declared the subway system was in a state of emergency. Do you, as of now, do you think that that statement still on or have improved, have come down, or, we, or, 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 or it has gotten worse? Um, well, technically, the state of emergency hasn't been rescinded, so technically the, the, uh, the uh, executive order still applies. And that, that order was put into place so that the MTA could take expedited action to address the deficiencies that led to the imposition but, of the but, state but, of emergency. But, but, but my, my view would be that um, 
we are state we're doing what the subway action plan was set was set out to do we have stabilized the system the number of major incidents as an average my is question down. is my question simple it is getting worse or no it's getting, getting better the, the, so the so, but if you look at the data, the service is is improving. I mean, you know, if you could take all my time, I just just yes or no. Yes, it got them better. Yes, according to you, it got them better. Yes, lots uh, more to do. Uh, in July 25th, 2017, Chairman Liotta announced a plan to stabilize stabilize and improve the subway system. The plan was called Subway Action Plan. Mm -hmm. So at that time, uh, uh, up to July uh, of, this year, of this year, they indicate that that plan has spent 333 million and, ha and it hires an additional 1,100 workers. Mm -hmm. However, however, the two metric that we used to 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 measure the improvement were uh, something called weight assessment and the other was called on time performance. Mm -hmm. But the, according to the report, both of those, the weight assessment and the on time performance, they have gone worse. No, no. So, um, Council Member, in October, we announced in October the, no, let, I, I'm familiar with this, these statistics. In October, the average for the, for the wait time was the best for three years for weekdays, the best for, um, an on-time performance, sorry, was the best for uh, three years on, weekend, on weekdays and the best for four years on weekends. The average wait time on the, both on platforms and stations was decreased and the number of major incidents was let also me, decreased. Let me read you some statistics. It does fluctuate, let I accept read. that. In 20, 2016, the weight assessment was 78.1%. Mm -hmm. in, in 2017, it, was, it came down yeah. to 75.9. Now this year, it went down to 71.9%. So how, how, so how, the figure, how, how the, do you call that improvement? The figure I'm quoting is uh, I'm comparing pre-SAP to post-SAP figures, and the October data does show that the number of major incidents was uh, decreased, the wait time was decreased, and the on-time punctuality was the best for three years. That's the October statistics as publicly so this, reported. So, this, so these statistics are wrong. I, I don't have the benefit of seeing what you're looking at. I can only go on these the publicly declared statistics at the October board meeting. So the, according to you, the way assessment time has... has for, for the October data, which showed a, an improvement in the wait time statistics, correct. And what about the on-time performance? On-time performance was the best for three years on weekdays, the best for uh, weekends for four years. So we're not saying the job is done. What we are saying is that because of this relentless uh, attention to detail via the subway action plan and the complementary back to basics campaign that we've introduced, because I felt that was missing, progressively, although it does fluctuate, uh, it, is, uh, big, it is turning the corner and getting better, but you won't get the step change unless we bite the bullet and do what's really necessary, which is re-signal and renew the infrastructure. Two, two more questions I finish. Since you, since, since the action, so action plan took effect to now, mm -hmm. uh, what would you say would be the, the, the percentage of improvement on the, on time performance? Sorry, say again, what's the increase in yeah, on the time? The percentage of improvement, according to you. Well, so let me give you some statistics. Major incidents have decreased 11.7%. Uh, average platform time and average train time have improved 2018 versus 2017. Service delivered has reached the highest level since the measure was introduced and is now at 95.8%. And the subway car um, average mean distance between failure has improved. It's now 122,000 instead of 115,000. So it's important to look at a suite of measures because where on-time on performance I get is what people understand because is my train on time or not? 
on time performance measures, I, is does the train reach its destination, the end of the line on time? It is one measure, it's not the only measure. You need to look at all of them. Thank you, my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, just to be clear, first of all, like, great plan, mm -hmm. great vision. Thank you. But do you also understand that you took a leadership position in an agency where riders, with all our rights, are frustrated? Very much so. And that we expect the action and progress mm -hmm. as yesterday? Uh, I am crystal clear on that, Chairman. Okay. So I, I think that that's... I can say that for me and for many New Yorkers, you know, and it's difficult to earn the trust mm -hmm. in our city because New Yorkers, by definition, we are individuals with hard opinion, you know, a strong opinion. And we all participate. And during the time of social media, which is, you know, the new leadership, and I trust you, I trust, trust Freddy Ferrer for his contribution that he has made in our society, and as a Latino who I am, it makes me very proud also to know that we have someone also from the same Caribbean islands where we're coming from that is in a good leadership position. But I think that the most important thing is, and the governor said in, in his speech when he presented some of these like, direction for where the MTA should be going, mm -hmm. which is we need to take this system and we need to fix it. And I feel that in a society where we being able to make the basic day, the fair fair, to build the Mario Cuomo Bridge, to take La C La Guardia going through important progress, I think that this is one of its legacy that all of us should make it. And I think that we need to do whatever it takes to really work in these five years. The question is, you know, what is the experience? What are you putting in place? And I get the description with the plan. For me, I, it was not in the 80s and the 90s that to build a toilet, it cost like $500. That's what the audit said. Like, still today I see the MTA, and I'm not talking about the new plan because now it's all about presenting the vision, presenting the plan. We need to get the revenue in place. But how can we guarantee the taxpayer that we will be spending, we're gonna be focusing only on repair and, man and, ma and maintenance, mm -hmm. and that we're gonna be giving the best use to every single dollar mm -hmm. of the taxes. Yeah, so, um, and we're very clear on that, Chairman. The, uh, the new leadership at the MTA, and if you think about it, pretty much everyone in the senior positions is new to their, either new to the company or new to their role. Uh, certainly the five um, agency presidents. Um, we're very clear that we need to change the way we do business. Uh, we have various work streams underway. We've got a working group that's looking at transparency and the way that we uh, share what we do with you. We've got another group that's looking at cost containment to tackle this, um, this much documented issue around the fact that NYC jobs uh, and, and major projects cost more than they do comparatively in, in major uh, cities elsewhere in the world. We've got another work stream going to look at our procurement practices to not only streamline them, to make them, um, to make them shorter to, so that we procure things more quickly, but also, and this speaks to your earlier point from your press conference, to attract other bidders back into the mold so that where uh, other companies have, um, have given up on dealing with the MTA, we want to attract them back because we, now it's easy to do business with us, uh, that we are more dynamic, that our processes and our procurement is that much more streamlined. Uh, and then the final stream would be with the various um, uh, the various uh, 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 transparency measures we've taken, things like dashboards, you should be able to and you should demand to see pretty much uh, uh, in granular detail how we're spending the money. The one point I would make is that, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? If you, if you are so concerned about the past because you feel that we haven't been transparent enough or we haven't proved worthy of your trust that you won't now invest, 
well, we're, we're kind of grind to a halt. We, we won't make a change. Someone has to make a leap of faith. We've got the plan, we've got new management, uh, and with new transparency tools and me means by which you can hold us to account, absolutely hold us to account, this is our golden opportunity and we shouldn't miss, miss it. But, but someone has to take that leap of faith or we are condemning New Yorkers to the status quo and I don't think anyone wants to do that. Do, do you think that Based on the numbers, and I don't know if you have that data in front of you, if not, if you can show it us, have we, see, have we seen a reduction of crimes in the train stations? Or um, is the number the um, same? It, it, well, there's different ways of measuring crime. Gen generally, subway levels of crime are at a low level, a record low level. Um, the, the, the individual constituent parts of the different types of crime get reported every four weeks at the uh, New York City Transit um, Committee, uh, and the, the police chief is, is held to account for that. But generally, it's a very safe system, actually. And when you look at statistically, we carry 8 million people a day. The actual number of crimes is very, very low. So is, do you think that the number has been reduced, let's say, this year, and as we are getting close to our over 2018 recent, people? Over recent years, the crime rate has come down. Oh. Okay. So enforcement, especially in both lanes, how, and you talk about that you had this calls with the NYPD on how they will improve their role to do enforcement. I, I think this how, and how does, Sure. Can you describe what the new, what those discussion is, was about, and how does that translate into new changes that we, that we will see in the street, mm -hmm. you know, against those drivers that they are parking, it doesn't matter who they are, yeah. NYPD, city workers, mm -hmm. a, any drivers, unless it's an emergency, should not be parked in a bus lane. So how that sure. plan how so, that new way of enforcement would translate into, what should we expect to see? How okay, so um, that <clears throat> we have to get the message across that parking in a bus lane is unacceptable, that it's selfish and that it won't be tolerated. It, it's just, it's not acceptable. The, the bus lane is there for good reason, it's to get the buses through. So to me, you need to have um, a suite of measures in order to make that happen. You've got to make sure that people understand that, that you've got adequate signage, You've got to have uh, the police properly targeted to treat it as a priority. You know, you see NYPD throughout the city, so I want them to take a very active role, not to be passive, but to be actively looking out for uh, inflagrations of um, bus lane um, blockages, that people shouldn't be doing it. They should be being told to move on straight away. I think there should be a very uh, robust penalty mechanism for people, particularly if they're repeat offenders, people who keep parking in bus lanes. And then finally, we want to seek more authority to have uh, both static cameras observing bus lanes and, and particular key interchanges, intersections, but also to have forward-facing buses on our cameras such that you could uh, um, real-time record offenders because the police can't be everywhere but to have a mechanism whereby we actually have recordings of uh, vehicles that are offending I think would send the message if you park in a bus lane you are al you are almost certain to be um, found, found out and there will be a very hefty penalty and so you need the two elements the deterrent and the penalty that's Great. What I will add in, I translate it into the question is, will we expect an increase of men and women dedicated to enforcement? Well, and I, I don't, and I, sure. I don't expect, I know asking for mm -hmm. a police officer to be, to leave a, a scene of a crime where he or she are assigned and then just go and do anything else. But yesterday, you talk about, I mean, the MTA as a agency, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you address like the millions of dollars that the agencies is losing because some people are not paying the fare, right? Mm -hmm. What was the amount? Uh, the amount, $215 million per annum. Right. So I, I think that it is important also to quantify, yeah. you know, the negative impact of those driving, drivers who are blocking the buses. Absolutely. And and put the dollars amount sure. on the value of time that how many individuals in average do we expect are getting late 
because people are blocking our buses. Mm. And at the same time, if we put the dollars amount, do we need to create a new unit only to be dedicated to enforcement? Mm -hmm. And if we dedicate a new unit just to do that, in the bus lane, can we be able to raise the revenue to pay for that group of people that the only thing they will do is enforcement? Can the New York City traffic, as we are now negotiating the budget, come to us and say we need additional 100 individuals only to be dedicated to enforce in the bus lane. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's about like a few years ago, there were some mayors that they came through, you know, from different parts of the world. And one of the questions that I asked in this case of Vision Zero was about what do you think about area where the city can do better to get our goal to reduce to zero the number of people being killed by a, in a crash? And the answer was, Enforcement. Mm -hmm. So if we know that enforcement will make a big difference to take a rider on time, mm -hmm. and therefore it can incentivize and provide a better experience for people to say, no, I'm not going to be just walking because sometimes I get from a one point to the other faster just walking because the bus being blocked by drivers. Yeah. So I just want to highlight that. That's good. So, so may I just respond to that? So. Uh, as a team, and I hope this came across in the presentation, we're not saying that uh, New Yorkers, sorry folks, you have to wait five years, ten years, you have to spend billions of dollars in order to get improvement. A lot of improvement on both the subway and the bus can happen and is happening right now. And, and that is through better management focus and in the context of what we're now discussing, uh, better direction to our colleagues at the, at the police, NYPD, and particularly the Transit Bureau to direct them on what we want them to focus on. So we are focusing them on, increasingly have been and, and still are and will continue to do so, on um, actively managing bus lanes, on actively managing fare evasion. But let me just come back to bus lanes. One of the advantages of having worked elsewhere is you see what, what works elsewhere. And um, one thing I think we should consider in the UK, there are different ways of managing uh, what I call arterial routes, key, key routes. And um, on some roads there are yellow lines. On, some lines, on some roads there are double yellow lines. But in London you also have what are called red routes. A red route and the lines are painted on the road red deliberately to denote that it's a red route and there's signage around it. A red route, every Londoner, you go and ask any Londoner what is a red route and they know, don't even think about stopping on a red route. You will definitely get uh, caught, you will almost certainly get towed and the fine is huge. Don't even think about it. So the red routes in London work really well um, because they're there for a reason. They're to keep the traffic flowing and they're to keep public transit flowing. So it might be something that we want to consider so that it's very, very clear. Don't even think about um, stopping in that particular corridor. Uh, and I think that's the kind of message that we've got to get across. So I think your idea about quantifying uh, the impact of selfish parking is a, is a good one. Um, I certainly am I'm about innovative thinking. I wouldn't rule out having a, a dedicated uh, enforcement unit with our colleagues at DOT, with our colleagues at NYPD, whatever it takes. Uh, we are pushing NYPD very hard with res early results on key routes. We're doing them one at a time. Uh, to, f to figure out where are the bottlenecks on each route to keep the buses moving. We will never get people back riding the buses while they're hopelessly caught in traffic. Okay. Do you understand why most New Yorkers don't support a fair hike? Uh, I, 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 fair hikes aren't popular anywhere, um, anywhere I've worked. No one wants a fair hike, uh, and people certainly don't want a fair hike when they don't think they're getting the service. Um, the dilemma we face at the MTA is that uh, absent uh, new revenue streams, we have a looming budget gap that we have to fill. So, you know, w what we urgently need are new, sufficient, affordable, sustainable revenue streams. But I, I, and again, I know that your role is to be the management of the agency and put in the vision, translate the vision into the 
changes that we need, or that we have to play or raise in the revenue. And, and, but I, I as of as I said before, that you understand it, that there's real concrete plan on the table on congestion price, taxes on the millionaire, that if we are able to get the Senate and the governor's support with those plans, we, would, we don't have to move on the fear high. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that the time where we are selling to New Yorkers that they should support this plan, mm -hmm. that they should trust the leadership, I feel that as we are in the middle of grade two plan on the table, you know, this is not yet a traditional time. I know that Fair High go through the process. We have a hearing, people talk. At the end of the day, we know that that will happen. This proposal is happening at the time. Mm -hmm. But we are asking also New Yorkers, there's two additional plans. Yeah. If you live in Queens and if you live in Brooklyn, yes, there's a reason why you should have concern about congestion price. You need to know that how the money will be reinvested Absolutely. in your district. And I feel, and that's why I support it, because I feel that with this plan, we will see real reinvestment of the money. Absolutely. That working class, middle class, will benefit with a congestion price. So I think that, I hope, and I've been saying over and over in the hearing, I hope that, you know, you as a board understand it, that if we want to make a case of building a no support, a strong support, we owe the plan where we can raise the largest amounts of revenue that is needed from the MTA. So I hope that you really, and again, it's a whole board, reconsider sure. the proposal for a fair hike. Understood, and, and I hear you. We, uh, let me just make a couple of points by way of response, if I may. First of all, and I, and I appreciate you all know this, as the, as the president of New York City Transit, I, I do not have a say in the fair rise. The fair rise is a matter for the board of the MTA, and, and that process is still ongoing. We're doing the fair hearings. We're listening to what, what uh, uh, New Yorkers have uh, say, what they think about a fair rise, what uh, other options they might have. So that is a matter for the board. Um, what I do know, though, and what I will say is, uh, again, I reiterate what we, we absolutely urgently need is um, sustainable, affordable, predictable revenue streams to come in, not only to cover the operating expenditure, which is the day-to-day -day fares, but also to cover the capital cost of things like fast forward. So um, people often assume that a fare rise is going to pay for fast forward. It isn't. Uh, congestion pricing is absolutely one of the mechanisms uh, that will pay for fast forward because it will give us that predictable, uh, substantial revenue stream that we need. So I'm very encouraged to see that there is a real momentum, I think, now behind congestion pricing. My answer would be that it's not the panacea. It's not in itself. It doesn't cover all of our needs. There will need to be other options looked at as well, and, and you as uh, stakeholders um, with your colleagues in state government and the feds, for that matter, all have a part to play in that. Um, what I, I can also say is I lived in London when the, when the congestion char charge was brought in, it was striking to see the impact on day one. Absolutely striking. And I remember in the run-up to the congestion charge being rolled out, there were siren voices, people saying it's not going to work, people won't pay it, people will cover up their license plates, the cameras won't work, people will get charged the wrong amount. Actually, it worked remarkably efficiently. And I remember the first day walking, I lived in central London, seeing the streets were practically empty. It was remarkable how well it worked. Um, and over time, though, the, the traffic levels did rise up again a bit, but not to the levels they had been. Um, and where London has succeeded is that you have now a sweet spot between fewer vehicles on the road because people don't want to pay the congestion charge, so that's good because there's less congestion, less pollution, the buses can get through the streets. But equally, because a lot of people are paying the congestion charge, that fee goes straight to transit. It cannot be siphoned off for anything else. It's lockboxed to go to Transport for London. And that's the model that we should adopt. So again, I'm not saying congestion charging is the only uh, solution. We need more than that. But that's the real answer to the MTA's funding woes. I, I feel that we've been selling the dream to New Yorkers for decades that we will upgrade the transportation system. Mm -hmm. 
So it's not the first time. I can say that this time around, we might few decades to be near, that this is like the more concrete one. Mm -hmm. But the beginning of the 2000, MTA came around, and they, they say that, they, that the system will be upgraded by 2017. Mm -hmm. And then in 2017, we were saying that it would take 40 years. Because of so, the you way know, it was being done. So this is about the lack of trust that is real because it's based about coming over and over. And it's no yes, the lack of resources because the MTA also been going through a lot of debt. You know, and that's we, New Yorkers, who owe the money. So I think that, you know, we, I can see a great combination right now. Mm -hmm. You as a leader being able to accomplish something that is difficult in the city to end the trust. Now New Yorkers want to see results. Definitely. The resident of Staten Island, they're saying, we need SBS. Mm -hmm. We need BRT. It cannot be that the only train line that we have there, our buses are not connected with the trains. Mm -hmm. So this is something that is needed, is important. As we have in our vision zero, we go by 2030 to reduce to zero the number of individuals being killed. When, what is the year? that we can say, and this can be the initial, the plan, we say all the station will be accessible. When, you're asking when will yeah. we be able to say if that? We, so, I mean, it's so, only right. a suggestion, can we? Sure. I know that in your, no. your plan make a lot of progress, yeah. but let me put it this way, Dagman Street, and I said before, if you want someone with disability, and you need to go to 233rd in the one train, and you live in the Dagman houses, you know where you need to go? You need to go take the A train, the one train, where there's only one elevator going downtown there. And in that elevator, you need to go to 96th Street. Mm -hmm. That's the next station going downtown with the elevator. Mm -hmm. Going to 96th Street in order to take that one train back to go to 231st. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the frustrating Three pieces about even to put that elevator, it took fight, it took lawsuit. When we had 900,000 New Yorkers who are in disability. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, I'm ready to fight with my colleague here to say, let's, con let's make the case. I'm down to say, if there's a real plan, I see the light in this plan. I'm ready to say, we need to raise the money. I don't want to say only that it's the congestion. I know that I don't know what is the whole thing about in this establishment. That it's all about is one or the other. I feel it should be both plan, congestion and the taxes to the millionaire. But on, when it comes to the making the station accessible, do you think that we should have a year in our plan that we can say in the next five year? Of course, I know that there's a plan for the next five year. When can we promise New Yorkers that we're going to be working to turn all station as accessible as they should be? Absolutely. So, so right. So let me just unpack that a bit, if I may, and I'll answer that question. You, you asked earlier, why should you trust, not you personally necessarily, but you collectively, why, why should New Yorkers trust um, the MTA? Because, you know, we've heard it all before. Well, the difference is you haven't. You, you now have fresh thinking. Why is it that the uh, re-signaling of the subway has been cut the timeline? Why is it that that's been cut by 75%, 60 years to, to 10? Because uh, we, are, we are approaching this in a different way. We're saying that there is a different, quicker way of doing it, and it could be quicker yet if UWB comes to pass. Why is it that suddenly we are saying that we can get to more, no more than two stops away from an accessible station within five years and be within striking distance of a fully accessible system within 10 years? Again, it's because of fresh thinking. And fresh thinking also includes things like um, one of the reasons why uh, elevator in installations cost so much is because the MTA has in the past tended to have bespoke uh, designs for each station and the, in the design itself, I would argue, is somewhat gold-plated. So one of the things I've instructed my team to do is to come up with a robust, still fit for purpose, we're not talking about some cheap installation, but robust 
cookie cutter design that we could say, go and install one of those and just keep doing it, contractor or contractors. Just keep doing it, work along the line, just keep doing it. Innovative thinking, like maybe even have modular construction where the majority of the elevators, shaft, etc., is built off-site, and then you bring it in and rapidly fit it at the location. So within that 10-year time frame, if you do the math, we could have the current 119 plus 50 plus 130. You will be almost, almost uh, complete of the 472 stations on New York City Transit. I'd just like to make one other point, and this is where you come in, particularly because uh, you represent city council and therefore you represent communities within this great city. The fast for being blunt, the fast forward plan will grind to a halt if everything we try to do, every installation we try to make, every elevator or every substation, because you need, you need to provide more trains to, to get the, the benefit of new signaling, you need to, um, basically you can, with new signaling, you can run more trains. In order to run more trains, you need more power. In order to get more power, you need more substations. The trouble is, no one wants a substation in their community. Quite often, people don't want an elevator installation on their corner. If we have to have a six-month standoff for every single installation, that plan will not happen within the time frame. So I, uh, I absolutely have to make that point. I need your help to do that. But if we, if we do bite the bullet with the fresh thinking that I hope you see in front of you, this is entirely achievable. This is our golden opportunity if we pull together co and co-fund this project. Okay. I, I can add that probably as someone that had to go through all the briefing, you know, before you started from day one on running this agency, one particular piece, I would say that whoever gave the briefing was not accurate, which is about council members want to see elevators in their station. Mm -hmm. And they that one, they support it. We even down to put capital to help in that one. What happened is that I, when I asked, let's say, for elevators in Diamond, so I said, well, it takes $25 million. What the hell, $25 million. What had to be changed on procurement? What had to be changed in the red tape that had to be cut to reduce that amount? Sure. But I feel that, as again, as we have a goal by 2030 on reducing the, the number of, of people killed by car drivers here, I think it is important if we also continue looking at this plan, and this is a right direction to go, to see, can we say that by 2040, all the station that we make all the station accessible, you know? And I just suggesting it, that you continue working with your plan, but put a day, put a year on when we should expect to talk to those advocates for the disability community. Mm -hmm. Not only we will see a number of station being accessible now, but we have a goal yes, on when so we complete and make all of them accessible. Uh, it's entirely within our gift. It really is. We, we, we as I've said, by the 10-year uh, mark, we would be <coughs> within striking distance of having f made all of the stations accessible. Uh, it would not take much longer to then finish the job off. There may be the odd station that is just physically impossible or because it would require a tenement building to be demolished, it would just be impossible. But um, I think it's entirely within our gift to have that fully accessible sub subway within uh, pretty much the, that 10 year time frame. And, that, and so I didn't, I, I chose my words carefully on that first day. You know, as the president of transit, you know you're going to be quoted. I was deliberately provocative in that respect because you know, at the end of the day, um, this is meant to be a bold vision. It's not meant to be a, a sort of steady as she goes plan. It's meant to be innovative and provocative and, and um, transformative. So that, that was the reason I, I, I listed a fully accessible transit system as one of the four priorities that I described okay. to you earlier. And my last thing before Council Member Ku and Richard has a question that I want to bring to your attention is one piece related to the presentation on engagement and empowerment mm -hmm. and employment, employees. Mm -hmm. And my suggestion is having in mind that New York City, especially those of us who are black and Latino, eh, when it comes to see our people having opportunity to go through promotion in the leadership, and it's nice for me, it's not enough to say we have a great intern chair who is Fernando Ferrer, 
but as, as organization, they are stronger than one individual. Mm -hmm. And I feel that when it comes to a city where, let's say, Angelo Falcón, who died, he is put it very well. New York City has 10,000 leadership positions and only 200 are Latino. Mm -hmm. And when you look to agency, there's a lack of black and Latino and female and women in leadership positions. So how can, in your leadership, what should we expect to see when it comes to diversity mm -hmm. in leadership position of the MTA? Okay. So um, this is a subject I feel very strongly about. I absolutely believe in promotion on merit. Uh, I don't believe in quotas because I, I feel that quotas uh, can rebound against you in that um, they, th they can be somewhat insulting to the people that you're trying to help. But what I do think you can do is take positive action and where there are two people of equal merit up for one job and the, the, one of the people in that, um, in that competition comes from an underrepresentative group, that's the definer. And so if I'm, it, I always say actions speak louder than words. If I could just describe my time at the Toronto Transit Commission, my previous job, uh, I, I arrived in 2012. There had never been a woman ever on the executive of the Toronto Transit Commission since its inception in 1921. When I left the TTC, the executive was 50-50 men and women. How did we do it? In exactly the way I just described, that where there were two candidates of equal me uh, merit, and that was uh, assigned both on gender and ethnicity, uh, the underrepresentative group got the, got the position. Fast forward to uh, now a New York City Transit, uh, I said to you earlier, there had never been a person with a disability, um, a visible disability on an executive. There is now, uh, I have a full-time accessibility advisor. That is an innovative uh, uh, first for the MTA. We have someone who he himself is a wheelchair user. He got the job on merit. Uh, the chief customer officer, female. The chief people officer, female. We have people from ethnic minorities on my executive. So again, I stress that it's done on merit. I think it's insulting uh, to do otherwise, but I do believe in positive action and you can expect that to continue under my tenure. This is the area that you need to be ready from my case to be pushed back from me and many other because this is not about quarter, this is about recognizing that we live in a society where if you're black and Latino, you don't have the same opportunity. Right. It doesn't matter if you are, you can be a detective working in a field, but you're gonna be you're doing the same job. And you can see many faces of people being promoted. This is part of New York City. Mm -hmm. If you work in an agency, you know, even though New York, Latino is 29% and Afro American is at 27%, it doesn't translate into the academic, governmental, or the private sector, even though the merit is there. Mm -hmm. So unless we have that uncomfortable conversation that we live in a city where it still is segregated based on opportunity in many fields, we will not address that problem. Understood. So I hope that you can look at it Understood. you know, with a fresh ear, but there's a reality. So we have people who are top engineers I Top know. architect, they are ready to perform as the same as other, but many times they are the first generation who are professional. Mm -hmm. They don't have a grandfather who was the profession, the father neither. And those people sometimes, when it comes to leadership, I'm not talking about the, law, the entry job. We need to push that envelope. And as this is important, you know, any pieces, this is all about running the transportation system efficient and mm -hmm. safe. Mm -hmm. Getting the first, the best men and women to do their job mm -hmm. based on merit. Yep. But we need to push in the same conversation of the merit to bring leadership to every single seat that we have at the MTA too. Understood. So I just want to assure you, Chairman, and, and the best uh, way I can assure you is to look at my track record as a leader. Uh, if you look at the executives that I have uh, set up, they, they absolutely are diverse. I recognize the benefits of diversity. And I also believe that New York City Transit should, its, its makeup should reflect the city that it serves. Um, so there's, uh, again, there's science behind why uh, one quarter of fast forward, in addition to the bus element, the subway element, the accessibility element, the four, I could have stopped there. 
But the fourth element is about management of people. It's about leadership, inspiration, development of people. And there, is, there are uh, explicit uh, commitments to uh, furthering the diversity cause within the Fast Forward Plan. OK. Thank you. Councilmember Ku, followed by Councilman Rich. <coughs> thank you, Chair. And thank you, President. Um, I'm Councilman Ku. I'm from uh, Flushing, Queens. Uh, we have uh, seven train stations, mm -hmm. um, which is a very busy station. Um, so I want to talk about something about the CBTC. Mm -hmm. uh, for most people, they don't know what CBTC stands for. So this is Communications Based Train Control. You know? Correct. So. So uh, on April 1st, uh, 2016, I attended uh, a seven train town hall meeting uh, hosted by council member Van Bremer. Uh, during this meeting, uh, we were given handouts uh, which included information on the communication-based con uh, train control. On page 18 of the handout from the MTA states that uh, CBCT installation will be complete by the end of next year. Uh, the meeting was in 2016. The system was supposed to be installed by the end of 2017. Uh, the system is finally done and it's already 2018 now. Okay. Uh, my questions, uh, uh, I have three questions. Um, so let me ask you all the questions first because uh, of the time limit, right? Uh, why was the installation delayed by over a year? Second question is, uh, during the first week of CBTC, there were huge delays on the seven train. Uh, how does the MTA plan on addressing uh, this so that it doesn't happen again? The third question is, is MTA looking to increase the number of express routes for Queens residents to alleviate congestion on the seven train? Mm -hmm. So personally, I was delayed on the train uh, a few times. No, many times I was at the second last stop. I was stayed there. The train was stuck there for half an hour, 15 minutes. No, I can walk home. No, but no, mm -hmm. but that time, mm -hmm. but the train was just too tired to walk. You no. Know? And sometimes you stay start at Woodside, which is many station away. No, you get stuck there for half an hour. So uh, I don't, I don't see why with the new system, well, uh, the trains often get delayed now. Mm -hmm. So how do you alleviate those problems? Okay, um, th those are all extremely uh, le legitimate and uh, very topical questions, uh, Councilman. So let me just answer those in, in turn. Uh, but a little bit of a tiny bit of background first of all if you recall when I talked about um, the way that we are approaching CBTC now and the way that we have reduced the time frame from uh, what was talked of 50 to 60 years down to 10 one of the elements I talked about was minimizing customization and mi and simplifying interfaces and the reason that's relevant in my answer to you is that I think we have learned lessons from the way that the CBTC installation has been done on line seven. In the um, going forward, I, I want to do that a different way. Um, the, the, what um, any signal contractor will say to you is, uh, it's, well, let me, let me put this a different way. I'm saying to signal contractors, if you've got a signal system in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in London, in Berlin, or wherever, that works really well, I want one of those. And my guarantee will be, we won't try and customize it and try and uh, uh, change it too much to, to, to um, adapt it to our particular needs. Uh, I think one of the complexities with the seven line, which has had various challenges throughout its um, its, uh, its duration, not including the fact that um, S uh, Superstorm Sandy caused quite a delay in the rollout of uh, the Line 7 signaling. 
I do think it's overly complicated. Uh, now, we are where we are. Uh, the job when I took over was to get this thing across the line, and last week we finally got the final cutover section done, but it is being done in a very complex manner. Uh, it's a bit of an amalgam between modern signaling but still relying on, on um, track circuits. It's, it's a bit technical, but there's still uh, what are called track circuits there. Going forward, I want to use a different technology called axle counters where you don't need track circuits. It, it takes out a lot of the complexity and a lot of the uh, single points of failure. So um, th th it, I arrived too late to change that for line seven. Uh, imminently, I will be announcing the appointment to New York City Transit of a world-class CBTC practitioner who we're headhunting, we're bringing him in. I should be able to announce him imminently. Uh, and, and his mandate from me will be uh, f full, uh, minimize or, or roll out the rest of this CBTC, but make sure we do it uh, working with the contractor, keeping it simple, not customizing things, minimizing the interfaces. So um, there, are, there are reasons why it was delayed by a year. Uh, I think um, the fact that we have delays at the moment are indicative of the fact there are still bugs in the software. Uh, I have the contractor on speed dial. I speak to them once a week, every week, and we go through what remaining um, deficiencies there are in the software that still need to be addressed. Uh, once they have uh, stabilized that software, which will happen in coming weeks, then we can, uh, it's not so much increase the express routes, what we will look to do is do two more things. One, move to what's called automatic train operation, which is where the operator doesn't even drive the train, same as on the L line. The, the operator presses a start button and the train drives automatically, so you get very easy, sp very regular spacing between the trains. Uh, and it's no secret, by the way, that the L line is by far the most punctual on the uh, New York City subway. It's by far, the, it's regularly 90% plus on time running. So seven will get that. The other thing that we'll do, once this thing is stabilized and in the spring, we're adding more trains. So we'll be able to run more trains on your, on line seven. There'll be more line capacity. What about the express bus service? Uh, the Queens? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. More, uh, oh, I'm sorry, express bus redesign. I, I thought you meant express routes on, yeah. on signaling. Express bus so ex express, bu uh, express buses, every route uh, and every borough um, uh, bus network is being redesigned over the next three years. We're currently in the Bronx. Uh, Queens will be uh, assessed. And as part of that exercise, we will be looking to see what, um, what stakeholders, what communities want by way of more SBS. So we are looking to roll out more SBS. In fact, next year, we will roll out five more SBS routes, uh, largely around the L-Line um, uh, project. But Queens, uh, we will listen to what the community wants. If the community wants more SBS routes, then that can go into that thinking. Yeah, thank you for your leadership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilmember Richard, followed by Councilmember Miller and Reynoso. I also would like to acknowledge that we were joined by Council being a joint. Councilmember Miller Salamanca, Dr. Reynoso Levin, Levin Espinal Cabrera, Levin Constantinides Lander, and Menchaca. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for holding this important hearing, and thank you, uh, Mr. President, uh, for all the work that you're doing. I want to congratulate you on coming up with an actual plan. Um, so I want to move into, so in October of this year, we're about uh, 56,139 delays. Mm -hmm. um, does the MTI study the impact of delays on revenue? And, and if so, can you speak to the correlation between delays and revenue that's being lost, whether it's via to Lyft okay. and others, uh, 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 ride hills? Okay. Um, not directly with revenue. I mean, we do, we do look to see if there's been a correlation uh, between ridership and revenue. So, so effectively, that would be indirect, because obviously if your ridership drops, then you would uh, have an, an adverse impact on revenue. Um, but the, the main thrust has been to, to identify the root cause of those delays and then to progressively assign corrective actions against each of them such that we can eliminate them. Uh, and so we have different pots of, um, of actions against each of the de uh, delay categories. But, you know, undoubtedly, there is a, there is a link 
linkage between unreliable service and ridership, because if you just don't think you're going to get reliable service, there is a real risk that you will migrate. So you would see market. a decrease in revenue because less people yeah, are riding. Yeah, if, if people migrated onto other um, means such as uh, Uber, for example, then you would see a, a decline in revenue. So you have to address that right. and, and arrest it. And is there a correlation between uh, fear hikes and uh, fear evasion. So I want to hop into that because I did hear uh, some of your comments this, this morning on uh, fear evasions. Mm -hmm. And I'm just interested in hearing a little bit more about that. Uh, in the past, as the MTA looked at uh, the correlation between fear hikes and fear evasion, um, well, I think, it, I think just logically, if uh, or the higher the fare goes, the more risk you run of people saying, I just can't afford it. Um, but but, it's, but for, which, for which reason? I think it's encouraging, very encouraging. We very much welcome the action taken by City Council to introduce the fair fares policy so that people on lower incomes do benefit, rightly so, do benefit from a uh, reduced fair. You know, evading the fair really shouldn't be the option because you're putting yourself at risk of arrest if you do. So there should be a lower uh, fair uh, available to people on lower incomes, and we very much welcome the action you took to, to address that. So we agree that uh, addressing the fair, uh, fair evasion issue largely needs to be methods such as fair fares and solutions such as that, correct? That, that plus adequate enforcement. I mean, you, you still have to have enforcement because it's not it's not accurate to say that all fair evasion is by people that can't afford it. So, uh, and so where do you, how do you make that judgment call? Um, well, I mean, in terms of the you judgment call. You have data call, that backs that up. Uh, well, I think there's a, there's a limit to how much you can continue to ask people to pay more. I, I think that's, you know, that's a, a safe statement to make that um, uh, obviously people can, can only afford to pay so much. Uh, that uh, and the, and it is for my board to dis, to, to, to to determine against the backdrop of the FT, uh, the, of the MTA's funding requirements the uh, tipping point and whether that's been reached. And so, take me through what uh, your station uh, managers or whomever would oversee this process. Is. So I read that you'll they'll block entrances. Is that correct? Sure. That, so that was my suggestion. What what we're aiming to do is. Um, is to show New Yorkers, the vast majority of whom do pay their fares, that we aren't just passively saying, oh, well, never mind, fare evasion's a phenomenon across the world, it just happens. I, I don't think that's fair to the people that pay. So what I'm advocating, and it's something that we've done, uh, I've certainly participated in the UK and in Australia, is that we would, on a rolling basis, have um, senior managers, you know, we volunteers, people that want to do it, and I'm, I'm saying that I will do it, uh, stand on uh, gate arrays to just uh, greet customers, uh, to, to, be, uh, to be visibly there, to act as a deterrent to people who are chancing uh, fair evasion. I, you know, it's getting that balance right, absolutely being sensitive to those people that can't afford the fare, and again, it's good that there's an option for them now, but equally, we can't just... Um, uh, give the impression to those people that do pay that we're not taking action uh, and thereby... Um, okay. Uh, okay, I have a few, uh, just to wrap it up. So it is your belief, and I think we, I'm hearing commonality here, that jailing low-income black and brown largely New Yorkers for a low-level offense, which puts them back in the system, uh, which eventually means that they won't be able to gain access to a job, which then means that to even get to a job appointment, you would need to have a job or, or access to, to money to actually get in the system. So I just want to be point out that we should be very cautious I agree. in putting that message out I agree. Um, because the revolving system means that they'll never pay, and that will be permanent as we create an undercast system, which is already being created in New York City, S will permanently mean that they will never be able to get uh, on the train. And my last question is, um, do, do you believe that... Uh, so we pay for a service. When you pay for a service, that means you should get the service, correct? 
So if you go out and you buy a product, you would hope that that product works, correct? Absolutely, 100%. So if your train systems are not largely working, should New Yorkers have to pay for something that's broken and not necessarily working? Uh, okay, so um, I just want to make one final point on, in, in response to your previous point. Uh, I do understand we must be desperately careful to get the balance right between uh, making sure that you know we're not just saying to people who do pay, it doesn't matter if people don't, because that, that's not fair to the, to the people that do pay, but equally be very, very careful, and, and we will be explicit in our instruction or direction to the NYPD to be very, very careful not to target certain communities. I cannot stress that enough. You have my but commitment in there is no guarantee that. that that would happen. Well, so, well, so that 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 would be a matter for the police. So we will, but but we will be very careful to to not give the wrong uh, signal. So you know, I say that in public, in public forum. But that, that signal has not, already been that, sent. That is not so our intention. We that is just, not our intention. Okay. okay. Um, but in terms of um, sh uh, should people not pay if they don't get the service that they uh, expect? I think we just got to be careful there because you will, if you're not, if you're not careful, you will end up in a massive downward spiral because uh, people then not paying means there's less money to provide service, which means service degrades, which means even fewer people pay, which means service degrades even further. No one, I'm sure you got yourself, you. Sir, Last question don't before the chairman kicks me off, though. So, should people receive a fair hike? Last question. Fair hike when service is horrible. Should we? I've never seen a scenario where we mark up the price on, a, for example, a, a lemon. Would you mark up the price on a, a lemon? A lemon is considered a hoopty, a horrible mm -hmm. car. Would you mark the price, price up on a lemon times five um, <laughs> if the lemon is, could barely start? Would you charge people the amount for Mercedes Benz, the, the same amount for a lemon? So the point I'm getting at is that the service has been horrible. It's not been, um, I mean, we've seen some modest improvements, um, but to mark, to say we should now do a fair hike on the back of New Yorkers when mm -hmm. service, where we still saw 56,000 um, delays in October, I think is, is a poor move and it doesn't show that we are getting at the crux of the issue and that we're going to continue to uh, charge and increase fares uh, on the backs of New Yorkers uh, who largely, majority, who are doing these fare evasions can't afford a fair hike, uh, but to say we should now incorporate a fair hike rather than getting at the, the systematic issues, one within the MTA, but secondly, looking at the other scenarios such as congestion pricing, the millionaire's tax, whatever scenarios we want to play with, uh, but to say we should do a fair hike, at the, fair hike at this point when the product isn't doing what it's supposed to do, I think is, is a poor uh, judgment. So that's okay, my so, so two yeah. points on that. One, uh, a, f a fair hike, whether we have one or not, is not, a, is not something that uh, I can determine. That is a matter for the MTA board, and that that decision will only be taken once the fair hearings have been um, concluded and once the various uh, public feedback has been received. That is a matter for the board. That's not a, a, a judgment call by me. Uh, secondly, though, um, you, you slightly preempted what I would have said, which is what, what we really need is sustainable, affordable, predictable, sufficient uh, revenue streams. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, let me interject with two questions before calling Councilmember Miller. On the CBTC, on the seven train, and, and it's, the question is more to see if you can give some light to what happened. It, even after the signal system was upgraded, the new one put in place in the seven line, mm -hmm. there was an announcement on delayed. Were you able to look at the delay? Uh, were you able to correct? Sure. And can you explain to us what happened in Queens that day when, you know, as anything you have is in place, there's also a space for readjustment. So where the, the new signal system fail or needed to be improved in the seven line that produced that delay? Okay, so can I just be clear, are you talking about a specific failure or general uh, problems that we've had on the seven? General, on the seven general. line. Okay, so um, there, there have been a number of problems 
uh, on the Severn line uh, in its first week of, um, of operation since, it was, uh, since the final cutover happened. Uh, some were not CBTC related. We had a fatality one afternoon. We had a switch failure on another uh, occasion which were nothing to do with the CBTC system, but others absolutely were to do with it. Um, the primary problem that we've been experiencing, uh, there's, there's uh, one particular signal that, uh, that is giving us problem that tells the contractor are working on. The second problem relates to what's called a loss of localization, uh, which is where the computer, because this is a, a compu basically a computer-driven system, the, the way this, the modern signaling works, the, the computer must know where trains are in proximity to each other and what their relative speed is, because that's how you maintain safe distance. You need to know where, where, where a train is uh, in, a, in comparison to the one in front or the one behind and what the, what the speed is that they're doing. So a number of trains were losing what's called localization, particularly around 34th Street on the west side of Manhattan. Uh, we now have a workaround around that. That problem will be fixed with a further software drop on the 15th of December. But um, we've, we've identified what the problem is with the contractor and that problem is now contained. And, and with a sex right, that is so important, especially for the community that with disability. It, I, we know that when we look at the MTA, they reported that sex right have a 392 million in service contract in 2017 and anticipate that service contract will reach 548 million in 2022 and increase on nearly 40 percent. Uh, between 22 and 2016, paratransit trip have also grown. So with that increase, with that services, that in the past, again, it was something that there was no trust. Mm -hmm. And we had to deal with that in, with cleaning those dirty clothes because this is about, here we are, new idea, new approach by understanding that people are frustrated, have been frustrated. Mm -hmm. So with that, with the pilot of e-health program costing nearly half as much as assessor ride, is the MTA still accepting new application for the pilot? And does the MTA have any plan to expand the e-health pilot? Yeah. So um, the issue with e-hail is that the actual unit cost of an e-hail ride is around 50% of a big van ride. So the, the big vans that you see driving around uh, New York cost double the amount of an e-hail ride. So in theory, people would say, well, that's great. E-hail is uh, a massive cost saving. However, um, for, for valid reasons, it is extremely popular because it does give people spontaneity. It does mean that they can um, you know, call up an e-hail ride and uh, enjoy the benefits that other people can enjoy and, and why not. Um, but, but that does mean that uh, demand is surging. The pilot that we currently have, which is unlimited for the participants, we have a number of participants in the trial, they are not limited in the numbers of rides that they can uh, call for, that they can request. And uh, the, 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 the demand is surging such that the, the actual dollar amount has exceeded what we would have now paid for the big van rides. So we're still evaluating that. No decision has been taken. Uh, we definitely need to seek further funding in order to uh, do what we want to do and definitely what the community wants to do. There is an absolute clear demand from the community to not only maintain e -hail, but to expand it. That comes at a cost uh, and we would like to find ways of accommodating that demand. Great. And I gotta say to my only Spanish speaking audience, since Spanish is my only, is my native language, que hoy estamos aquí trabajando para asegurar que la MTA modernice la transportación de la ciudad para que los trabajadores lleguen a tiempo a su lugar de trabajo, para que las personas lleguen a la cita médica a sus escuelas. Y hoy estamos en disposición de trabajar con la MTA, apoyarlo para que tengan los recursos necesarios pero la MTA debe asegurarse que va a controlar el costo y que va a trabajar para que la transportación de Nueva York sea eficiente y seguro para todos. With that, Council Member Miller, followed by Council Member Reynoso. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. 
and President Bifo, good to see you and your, your team as well. So obviously I, all, I, I echo the sentiments of all of my colleagues about uh, the transit uh, new ambitious um, fast forward plan, um, but it also comes with, with, with a, a bit of skepticism because I spent 25 years in the authority as well as had the opportunity to work in Washington's Metro, BART, CTA, and even TTC, as well in Toronto, um, I've seen changes or the lack thereof. And, and what I'm concerned with here, I, honestly, I think we can absolutely accomplish this on so many planes if we have the type of cooperation that, that is necessary. Um, but my concern is, is, is the timetable um, of, of the plan and whether or not we, we, we are neglecting state of good repair, whether or not we are putting certain communities over others. And my colleagues uh, uh, mentioned uh, transportation equity. Transportation is the great equalizer and there are communities such as my, the one I represent, Council Member uh, um, Richards, that this is a two hour commute out. For me this morning it was an hour and 40 minute commute here to City Hall one way. Um, one would think that those communities, those transportation deserts would be the priority. Um, this plan does not prioritize Southeast Queens and other communities such as that. Um, and, and I'm not gonna touch too much on trains, but it does not include the J train which supplements the E, the F, the L which is going on now. It runs on a regular local line. I think that we can do because of its uh, has not reached its capacity, one of the full, few lines that is more that we can do that that would impact the other lines. I want to talk about buses. Um, the, 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 the depot that, uh, that's in the capital plan, hopefully we'll see it uh, knocked down in the next few months. Mm -hmm. um, services, about 75% of Southeast Queens uh, riding community. Everybody takes a bus to the train but we can't get there for so many reasons. You have the oldest and most antiquated depot in the system. I read in one of your reports that the duty time of the buses were 12 years. As you make a depot, one third of the, of the fleet is from 1998, mm -hmm. right? It, it, they leak when it rains and it's a problem. On the other side, as we procure new equipment, it seems to be that we're more focused on customer immunities, uh, Wi-Fi, then safety. Chair mentioned Vision Zero, whether or not we have the proper mirrors, whether we have the audio system that many fleets have that ask people to step away from the bus as they make turns. These are the things that we should be focusing on mm -hmm. to keep safe. But I also noticed that the older models, seat 43, the ones that have been purchased over the past five years, seat 36, seat 31, seat 34, which impacts load guidelines and the amount of people that you can sit on there. As to uh, uh, Councilman Richard men mentioned loss of revenue. Mm -hmm. We have the largest proliferation of commuter vans, dollar vans, underground transportation systems, simply because people can't access buses. And so that's not only is a serious loss of revenue, but it's denying people. Look, while other folks are getting ferries and trolleys and all these other things, um, it appears that there are other communities that their transportation options are illegal and unlawful dollar vans. And so how do we address that? Okay. I didn't quite catch the question at the end. How, so do, we, how, how, how do we make up for the loss of service sure. that we have here that, that is obviously going, you, you mentioned Lyft, but in this case we have a proliferation of illegal vans that Absolutely. carry people unsafely throughout the city. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I might just comment though just generally on, on one of the points you made at the start. In terms of community equity, um, the fast forward plan, it may not be as overt as it, sh it should have been, but it is designed to be equitable across the whole of the city in that the elevators will be installed across the whole of New York, all five boroughs. 
the uh, bus improvements are, are meant to address the whole of the five boroughs via the, uh, the uh, um, redesigns, the, the borough redesigns that we do. New vehicles will be spread throughout the five boroughs. Station renovations will be undertaken throughout the five boroughs. And even the CBTC, I get the point that you make about, say, the J and some of the extremities. But A, don't forget what I said. If UWB is a goer, then we might be able to do things more quickly. And B, people who live in some of those communities will still benefit from when they hit the core section which has been addressed um, I mean, and in terms of focus on amenities I agree with you absolutely state of good repair is job one I've always said that in every job I've done uh, state of good repair should take precedence over expansion and it should most certainly take ex uh, precedence over nice-to-haves, uh, aesthetics, if you like. Uh, so certainly new buses we're now fitting as they come into service will be fitted with things like um, uh, turn announcements on them. Uh, the dollar vans are, a, um, are an issue. I mean, I understand why they're there. Uh, what we need to do is redesign the bus uh, provision such that we make bus travel um, exponentially more attractive so that it's affordable, the vehicles are modern, the service is frequent, the service is reliable, um, and that you get vehicles commensurate with the demand. So we know that Jamaica Depot uh, does need to be reconstructed. I was just checking um, that that uh, is being awarded. That will be awarded in 2020. Um, the, uh, we know that depot, that depot is an absolute priority for New York City Transit to get it reconstructed such that your community gets the vehicles it deserves. Can I just, and, and Chair, the, the finally, uh, um, we talked about enforcement. Right now, N New York City Transit police um, don't have oversight on buses. And so incident occurs and, and we have to, although you're transmitting with Radio Command Center, they then coordinate with NYPD. Why not New York City Transit and have dedicated folks, as he said, the mm -hmm. chair. Buses mm -hmm. at the main transportation hub cannot get to the curb because vans are parked there. Yeah. People are forced to load and unload in the middle of the street, in the rain, in the snow. And on top of that, to add insult to injury and irony, that's a bus lane. And so they come out and they're debating whether or not they, they take it for being in a bus lane or standing or parking or whatever it is. There has to be some continuity around enforcement and, and it, it really has to happen now. So what, what I was saying in terms of um, the plan, I, I get the plan, but are we putting the, the, the chronological line of the plan above the needs, the community that have the highest need, and, oh. and I'd like to see that take place. Sure, so, and you make a very valid point. Sarah and I attended a town hall in Jamaica uh, fairly recently, and I saw firsthand the uh, issue caused by the dollar vans. I saw them all lined up, um, and I've heard firsthand from both customers and from operators about the problems that can be, um, can be caused by them. Uh, uh, for example, the fact that the bus operators can't get to the curb. So um, we are looking uh, at different options with police. Uh, at the moment, the uh, precincts deal with um, street level uh, policing rather than MTA police or the transit bureau. Uh, but it's something that's very much a hot topic within the organization right now. It's on my to-do list. Um, we are determined to make things better at places like Parsons Archer, where I was just the other day with Sarah, where we looked at what was going on with the dollar van. So that, rest assured, that doesn't need the fast forward plan. It doesn't need five years. It certainly doesn't need 10 years. It's something that we're focused on right now. And I'd be happy to um, keep you appraised on, on how we're going with dealing with that. Thank you. Thanks. But you know what is what we're missing in that piece is to be concrete as all pieces of your plan. Mm -hmm. What New York, as you know, we will increase the signal system Understood. by this number in this lane. How many men and women from front traffic will be designated to enforce? in both lanes. People like, people need to hear that. Yeah. Because what happened is that if we live as the NYPD, we'll be enforcing, do the enforcement. Put it in a survey. Do you feel that the men and women in the NYPD should be responding to a crime or are enforcing in the both lane? Mm -hmm. All of us were saying the crimes. 
So my thing, and that's my suggestion, that as you were able to put your number, say, because a large number of people, they're not paying the fare when they get into the bus. We are losing close to $300 million. Well, how can we use $50 million, or I mean, $50 million of those to enforce using technology and other things? Mm -hmm. So if we are able to do the assessment, you know, got to say, as I said before, with the impact or the lack of enforcement in the bus lane, and we translated those hours that people are losing to go to work, to go to school, to go to any place, any destination. I feel that we can work together and support the creation of dedicated bus traffic enforcement units to be able to go after anyone who blocks a bus. Mm -hmm. And if not a creation of a new unit, which I, which I call for, at least to be specific, yeah. to come back as you're gonna be moving into the approving of the budget and say, we had this conversation with YPD, and from now on, there's gonna be 50 men and women only dedicated to enforcement. Unless that happen, people will not trust mm -hmm. because they have no big enforcement when it comes to drivers blocking buses. And because of that, we've been seeing a reduction Mm -hmm. or riders using buses. It's not because of Uber, it's not because of Lyft, it's because it takes so long mm -hmm. for a bus to go to their destination. So sure. whatever we can do, and I know that that's the Understood. spirit, I but I'm calling to create a, a dedicated bus traffic enforcement unit as a solution to know who are responsible to go after those drivers who are blocking our, our lane every day. May I just comment on that, Mr. Chairman, the, um, just to put your mind at rest. I mean, the job one for me was to get the plan out and to get it socialized, to go out, which we've done, and to, to uh, whet New Yorkers' appetite for that plan. Uh, and I think we've largely been successful on that basis. The, it's received a very good re um, response from the advocacy groups. It's received uh, generally a very positive reaction from uh, uh, stakeholder groups, from uh, customers, actually, at town halls. But we absolutely know that to make the case we need to, to, to really make the case, we need to do a couple of things. Number one, we need to uh, make sure that we've uh, really nailed the case for the associated budget, the finances, and we need to give uh, assurance that the figures are robust and that they're well thought through and that you can trust them and that you can hold them to us. And number two, to your point in, in, your, in the comments you just made, um, we are now quantifying the benefits that the various elements of fast forward will bring. Some of them are fairly obvious because we can say um, uh, definitively that within five years you could be no more than two stops from an accessible station, which is a, a strong statement and, and definitive. But what we really want to do is things like, uh, if we get this line converted to CBTC, this is the uh, impact on you as an individual. It will mean you get a train every X minutes instead of the current every Y minutes. Uh, in other words, we'll be increasing the trains per hour by whatever percent. Typically, it's around 10%. Um, we would, uh, uh, to your point about bus lanes, I think it, uh, you make a valid point. It would be good if we were to be able to quantify if this bus on this route if the bus lane was entirely clear end to end, the journey time reduction would be X number of minutes. So I think that's a good suggestion. Okay. Um, that, that we should be able to quantify, and it was always on our to-do list to come up with that uh, quantifiable data as part of the selling case in the seminal run-up to the, to the budget discussions in Albany in spring. We're on the case. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Reynoso, follow by Councilmember Ross. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, President Byford, for being here. It's always good to see a state-led -led agency show up to the City Council, first and foremost. Uh, uh, I, I want to say, uh, ask a couple of questions. Um, the first one is your concern about having to, to take on, let's say, a six-month timeline to install an elevator due to, like, uh, I guess, Euler processes or some type of processes that, that'll slow it down. Um, in a state of emergency, do you not have the authority to move forward with uh, the building of, let's say, elevators for um, accessibility um, without consent or, or, 
or the need to get an authority from, I guess, the council or from the mayor or from the, the state? Um, no. To a certain, uh, the, what the, the state of emergency EO 168 gave us was the ability to expedite procurement so that you could, you could fast track certain elements of procurement and fast track certain elements of um, gaining authority. But that did not circumvent or replace uh, the normal um, consultation timelines which we would normally have to follow with local communities. So that, 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 that's why I made the point I did earlier. We would still need your help to make that happen. So I just want to first say I'm here, uh, letting you know every elevator you want to build in my district, I will do everything I can to make sure that you have full authority to do it as you wish. If you want to start in Williamsburg and Bushwick and Ridgewood, you have full authority. I will never stop you from doing one. It's the right thing to do, and we shouldn't be bureaucratizing you to a place where you can't get things done. Um, uh, another thing that I just want to make note to you, the fair evasion situation is a problem, especially for communities of color, um, not because people shouldn't be paying their fare. Um, there's a car culture here in the city of New York um, uh, where having a car has you at a, a certain standard or, or, or um, you're held to a different, uh, different standard. Um, if you cover your license plate and you run over a toll, the worst case scenario you would get is a ticket from a police officer. If you're a black kid and you jump over the turnstile, the worst you can get is going to jail. Mm -hmm. um, there seems to be an inequity as to how we deal with fare evasions depending on where you are, whether you're taking a train or whether you're in a vehicle um, crossing over the GW or the George Washington Bridge, for example. Mm -hmm. So understand that these equity issues really are a concern for us because we're not targeting more affluent car owners, but instead um, targeting mostly young people of color. So that is, the equity issue is the problem, not necessarily the fact that you need your money. Um, I wanna ask, related to your issues on uh, the congestion pricing. Obviously we have nothing to do here. Uh, that's a state issue. The state has to agree to do it. We've already actually had a quite uh, a unanimous support almost in the council for you to get your congestion pricing to move forward. Um, I wanna ask, is there something else that you might need? Is congestion pricing the answer to it all? And if not, what else can we do to be helpful um, in our capacity as a city council? Okay. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, so um, congestion pricing will, will go a long way to, to helping our needs. It will provide a revenue, a regular, sorry, a revenue stream, which would rightly be absolutely dedicated to transit. Couldn't be siphoned off for anything else. It would be lockboxed. Uh, to provide um, spe specific defined output. So you say that, I just wanna, you say that it's gonna be locked box. Well, so that's I, a guarantee. Well, sorry, I should caveat that. My belief is it should be. Okay. Uh, in <laughs> London, okay. which I think is good practice, is it was. So London has had the confidence that the congestion charge they were paying could not go anywhere else. It had to go into London's transport system, and it did. This, so, is, this so is the state of New York, though. I just want to be clear. Well, the so state likes to take money and move it around so um, to I'm its not, I'm not making a political comment. I'm giving you my professional okay. opinion. Um, I will that, that, though, suffice? No. Um, that will not in itself, in isolation, cover the totality of what's required for both fast forward and the uh, broader yeah. uh, MTA and even New York City Transit State of Good Repair um, uh, funding issues. We, we still will need other mechanisms. Um, and that, you know, obviously that's more of a, a decision for stakeholders. Um, some, some of it equally we can generate ourselves. We need to be looking uh, imaginatively at different delivery models. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to be looking at different um, funding um, mechanisms whereby we, we might be able to raise more through bonds or through other, um, other procurement methodologies that would, would contribute to the overall figure. Uh, but I've heard various proposals bandied about. Uh, it will be really for stakeholders to determine in which are the most appropriate. All I know is okay. we need more money. Okay, so you are gonna need more money. And the last thing I'll leave you with is um, the enforcement on bus lanes. Uh, it speaks back to our co-culture. There's a privilege that drivers in the city of New York yes. drive around with. That makes it so that running over uh, a, a red, uh, a red painted uh, bus lane or double parking is just a privilege, that, a blind privilege that they drive around with. And you, it's not your fault. It's a New York City infrastructure forum. We also have issues in our leadership here in the administration that doesn't understand that. Um, so while we want these buses to move, so long as we continue to 
uh, endorse and support car culture is going to be very hard. So just saying it's not all your fault. You're doing everything you can. <laughs> Enforcement won't necessarily work. It truly is about breaking car culture. But I thank you for your time here, and thank you, Chair, for this, thank you. Uh, for this hearing. Thank you. Thank you. That took as long as it takes a, a commuter to get to Staten Island on the express bus. I'm sorry. <laughs> President Byford, um, I think last night you heard a resounding um, uh, cry that uh, Staten Islanders don't want a fair hike or a toll hike. Staten Islanders feel that, you know, um, that if, there's, if the services were delivered, um, then it would warrant an increase but the lack of service does not warrant an increase. And um, the bridge toll um, is already ridiculously high and that we shouldn't be paying to subsidize other systems. So the complaints that we've heard about the fast forward bus um, tracking is that people have to walk um, on busy streets with unpaved um, walkways to uh, bus stops that are, you know, really far distances, and it creates a, a problem for people who have mobility issues. Um, our rides have increased 60 minutes each way, um, which makes it a 120 minute increase um, than it was before, especially the Midtown routes, the Fifth Avenue route, the X-14, and that um, we need more buses because people are standing now on the buses and um, the afternoon schedules start or resume too late, um, that people who are religious observers, um, people can't get home in time for the Sabbath um, before sundown. And so um, while you, I have to say, I have to give you credit, you've been responsive to our constituent complaints um, as we relay them, um, and some adjustments have been made. Um, it just seems as if the changes were made um, without enough input from, from the uh, commuters. Um, for example, we were constantly asking and calling the MTA to put notices on the buses that, you know, about the changes, about the hearings, and, um, and every day we would get, you know, feedback that there were not notices on the buses that people were actually taking to work that would have informed them of the changes. So I want to know how many people ride the express buses to and from Staten Island, and how many did we hear from during this um, process when you were formulating the plan? And if in hindsight, um, in retrospect, do you think that um, the plan was rolled out um, before you really addressed the riders' concerns, and how many complaints have you received? Um, and, you know, to what extent have you tried to address them? Mm -hmm. okay. And um, if, in fact, there were any lessons that you've learned from, you know, the fallout from Staten Island Express bus riders, um, and um, have you formulated a, a way to do better outreach um, with the redesign of the systems for, for the other boroughs. Sure. Okay, so thank you for the question. I mean, I, I enjoyed uh, being back on Staten Island last night, and um, yeah, absolutely, I heard what, what people had to say, and that was the whole purpose of what is at the end of the day a town hall. So um, there are 36, I think it's 36,000 trips that are taken daily on Staten Island Express buses, so that's trips. Uh, that's not individuals, but that's trips. So, to, so to, it might be um, return so journeys that's or buses something like that. Going back and forth. Yeah, sure. So, 36,000 trips. And um, although I don't have the exact number to hand, uh, we're just checking to see if we can get the complaints number. Um, you asked how many people did we consult? Uh, yeah. Again, I'd have to take that on notice. Um, but I came into this process about halfway through, and certainly, if my experience is ending to go by, I went to a number of the town halls that we had. Number of the consultative sessions, um, and I would say that we, I can confidently say we consulted with certainly thousands of people in various ways. There were people who were consulted face to face at various community uh, centers on Staten Island um, and through various other media. Um, the 
do, would we do things differently? I think what has to be said is this is the first time we've ever done this. We, we set out to respond to what we were hearing from both Staten Islanders, uh, elect, to a certain extent elected officials, um, but certainly from um, operators themselves who were telling us that there was an overriding desire to change the bus network to make, uh, the, um, to make it quicker to get off the island because each of the, uh, the, average, uh, the average number of stops to get off the island was something like 27. So the buses went on this hugely circuitous route around the island before you even uh, departed the island and that was frustrating people. So we aimed to straighten some of the routes and what was also frustrating people was that what happened when the buses got to Manhattan, that there was a feeling that the buses didn't adequately serve Midtown or West Street, and that they got hopelessly caught up going round the loop at, at the south side of Central Park, which is why, why the, the redesign happened in the way it was. Did we get everything right? Well, I think the evidence would suggest no, we didn't, because um, while there's a lot of people who have said they do like the new service, and typically you don't hear from them, there is, there is definitely still a vociferous group that don't like the new service that feel for them service has degraded. We can point to the fact that the uh, average speed of the bus network has increased. We can point to the fact that the um, punctuality has, has improved, but I recognize that for some people they don't see that, and that that's why we're continuing to make changes. You know, I, I, would, I would agree with you if it was a small number of people that were, were dissatisfied. And if we were just talking about the fact that their walk to the bus stop mm -hmm. um, increased, um, you know, somewhat. But we're talking about the elimination of that whole midtown um, route and that people's ride has increased. Um, exponentially over what they were getting home before <laughs> and that there are lack of buses in the evening um, where the service started earlier in the afternoon but that doesn't exist so um, we've taken you know we you've done a wonderful job with the circuitous routes but by eliminating them it just seems as if you streamlined the, the, um, the bus routes to save costs and not really looking at what the need was for the ridership. Um, and, you know, um, and I, I don't know, have you saved any costs? No, by it's a, no, 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 it's actually costing us more. Um, and so the, the primary driver wasn't actually to save costs. The, the primary driver was to... Um, to attempt to streamline the, the routes in, uh, to, to, give, um, to have a fresh look at the network to give people what they wanted uh, now in 2018 rather than a route, route network that was designed years ago and arguably was no longer fit for purpose, which is effectively the philosophy behind the whole of the bus redesigns. Um, then Sarah why, tells, are, why are people standing on the buses? I, I mean, in... And the community that comes through Marinus Harbor, people are standing for Understood. the duration of the trip. So we are, we are looking at that, and there's a further raft of changes happening next month in January to try to further address that. Uh, the one counsel I would uh, put forward is, I think some people, not yourself, with the greatest respect, some people to a certain extent view the former network through rose-tinted spectacles in that you know, it was always on time, there was never any standing. Well, there was. Um, you know, it's not as though this is a new phenomenon. Sometimes people did stand on the old X network. My commitment to you... But not the you, same volume. My, my commitment to you and to the borough president is we will not let up until we get this uh, Staten Island bus network as good as it can be. And um, if I really thought that the answer was to say, right, you know, no shame, sorry, let's just scrap it, let's go back to the X network, no. uh, then I would. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I'm not going to need jerk to do that because um, there are equally people who tell us they really like the new network. For them, it's worked. So the the outstanding uh, challenge is to still address those. Uh, deficient points that still exist and my commitment to you is that we will not let up until we've done that. I'm glad to hear that. I'll be in touch. Sure. Thank you. Oh and the number of complaints by the way was 888 for October. 888 for October. Thank you.
you know, I have been, and I will always be advocated for all New Yorkers, but especially for the residents of Staten Island, that I need to have better bus services since they only have like a one short line train. That also they neither, that neither had the best connection with the SBS or any buses from the station to the destination. And for the residents of Staten Island, I also signed in my pledge to be a vocal against the fear hike known in the train, but also for the toll, which is the only sort of way that they have on how to go back for those that had to drive back to the Staten Island. Mm -hmm. So with that, Council Member Dutch, followed by Council Member Menchaca. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, uh, firstly, I want to uh, thank you, President. Under your leadership, I feel uh, pretty confident and hearing all your, your fast forward plan and having the other hearings that you, you uh, came down to here to City Hall. Sure. But um, I, I have to uh, say that I have started taking the train, the subway now. And just last week I took the subway twice under your leadership. And I'm looking forward to continuing doing that. One thing I see is that people on the train might be sometimes a little moody. I don't know if there's something that, that you know, because I walk into the train. Look, when they're walking, before they walk in, they're smiling and everything. Once they go underground, they get kind of moody. So I try to cheer people up and go inside, and this lady pulls up these earplugs just not to listen to me. But, you know, maybe we have to find a way to make people more, you know, cheerful once they're underground. And my trains were not running late. They were on time, and I went from point A to point B in a timely manner, mm -hmm. and just, I just find that people are just moody in the train. But I, I want to talk about um, the fare hike um, on the Verrazano Bridge, mm -hmm. and um, one thing is that, first of all, there was a public hearing which ended up on Hanukkah, and, and I always feel that um, when it comes to the state or the city, uh, I had certain um, instances just recently where the city put out a public um, a job opportunity on a holiday and they ended up switching it uh, or giving an extra date that was a non-holiday. This is where we give everyone an opportunity to attend these public hearings, which, is, which are very important. So I wanted to see um, the one you had in Staten Island was, I believe, last night which was on Hanukkah, if we could do an alternate date. I know a lot of people are not tech savvy to go online and to testify online or even to send emails, especially um, sometimes you find senior citizens. So I want to see if we can get an alternate date on that. That's number one. Number two is that uh, the cost of, for Staten Island is to come into Brooklyn. Um, I just feel that it, it would be fair to just charge them one time per 24 hours because I have uh, spoken to people who carpool the children into Brooklyn, then they get back to Staten Island, and then they come in later on to pick up the child. Sometimes they do shopping, or sometimes within 24 hours they visit family. So it just disenfranchises people living in Staten Island from coming into Brooklyn, and if they have to do their shopping, they would rather go to Jersey then come into Brooklyn. Um, so I think like a one shot fear uh, within 24 hours would, would be kind of fair for that. Um, and thirdly, um, I just want to touch upon what someone mentioned, I think it was Donovan, Donovan Richards, that if uh, transportation is no good, people shouldn't be charged. Uh, sometimes you're sitting on the bridge or getting to the bridge and there's a broken down vehicle, disabled vehicle, and people sit in traffic literally for hours. And when it's the fault of something that happens on the bridge, maybe people shouldn't be charged for that. Um, and because, uh, you know, you're charging people for going over the bridge, and that's a toll. That's a toll for them to get there quicker, like even like a tunnel. You want to get to the tunnel opposed to going over the Brooklyn Bridge, you expect to get there quicker. Right? But if you're sitting in the tunnel for three hours in traffic, then it becomes, it becomes an issue, and you, now you're being charged for sitting in the traffic when sometimes the Brooklyn Bridge may be clear. Mm -hmm. We can't always rely on, on our friend Waze all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the three things. Okay, thank you. Um, 
First up, the, uh, the point came through loud and clear. When we were at the uh, hearing last night, a number of people did make the point about Hanukkah, so uh, that, that, that was certainly, uh, that resonated with me. There is another opportunity, not via, um, by on, online, but there is a video, uh, f a means of providing video testimony at St. George's Terminal between 7 and 10 a.m. today, is that? Tuesday. Tuesday. Next the Tuesday, 11th. the 11th. So we'll make sure that is well advertised. Next Tuesday, the 11th, St. George's Terminal, people can supply video testimony 7 till 10 a.m. Um, the, 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 the point you make about the Verrazano Bridge, I'll pass that back as part of our uh, collective feedback. Uh, again, uh, it's the board that will decide on um, fare increases and also toll increases, but we are gathering uh, feedback and gathering uh, people's opinions. So that will add to the uh, general uh, con uh, comments about the, the bridge last night, which again came through loud and clear. Um, and then uh, in terms of not paying when service isn't provided, again, I do get the concept, absolutely. I, I totally understand the concept. I think we just gotta be careful that you don't get into a downward spiral where, because people then say, well, I'm not paying for that because I didn't get the service I wanted. That's even less funding for the already deficient public service, uh, deficiently um, funded public service, such that then things deteriorate even further, so even fewer people pay, so the service gets even worse. You've got to watch you don't get into a death spiral. That's my only yeah. point. Yeah, so on the third thing, I just want to say, um, we, had that, uh, we had that snowstorm, the few inches of snow, and the George Washington Bridge, there was a 20 uh, car accident that was uh, basically cr um, crippled our city. Yes. Um, so when there is a no toll charge, let's say in the George Washington Bridge, then maybe those cars would have been moved quicker, mm -hmm. right? Because people sat in traffic literally for hours. So no, people should pay, but then we're going to hold the city and state accountable for their actions to make sure that they would know that if they don't do their job properly, then they're going to suffer. It's a penalty. So um, that's one of the reasons why I brought it up. I, I agree with you, the, the money, the funding needs to come in, but we need to hold those agencies accountable that on their part, if they don't do their job and they're not competent when it comes to a crisis, then they need to be penalized. Understood. Yeah, Thank and you. thanks, President, for everything you do. You have a great team. Okay. very um, responsive and always accessible. So I want to thank, give a shout out to Tim, um, always being available. Thank you. Thank That's you. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Byford, for being here today with us. I want to also thank you and your team for your work. We've done a lot of work in the district, and uh, I also want to thank all the workers, the TWU, mm -hmm. uh, that show up every day uh, in the crisis that we're in and do the work with honor. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Southwest Brooklyn, uh, the district that I represent, I think, is, uh, can tell us a lot about the future and the plan that you're working on. I want to think about the ferry, uh, a city-driven plan, but a transportation plan as well. Mm -hmm. How have you studied the ferry in terms of the work that you're doing to improve things on land, and how is that impacting your work? Uh, and I want to think about Red Hook as an example, uh, you and I have spoken about this before with your team about a minibus uh, that would take Red Hook residents and workers to and from Manhattan and bring them into the, the kind of center of lower Manhattan and, and kind of thinking a little bit about, about how the ferry impacts that, that analysis, the costs of that. I think your team is going to work on some cost analysis on, on that. Uh, and then. Okay, let's go over there and then I have two more questions. Okay, so one of my mantras, personal mantras, is anything's possible. And, and what, I'm, what I'm trying to do in transit, New York City transit, is bring fresh thinking where it doesn't matter what's gone on before, uh, blank sheet of paper. Let's co no, nothing is a bad idea. Let's have a look at everything. And, and our default should be yes unless we can rather than no unless we can't. Um, 
yeah, yes, unless we can. So, so uh, yes, unless we can't, sorry, I'll get that right. I want it to be a positive uh, reaction that at least you'll get to, to hear, we'll get to listen to you. You'll get, you'll get a, a fair hearing with us, right? Um, you know, so if you've got new ideas, we'll, we'll hear you out. It won't be a case of, sorry, we know best. Um, we're not prepared to countenance new ideas. Um, so uh, that's the mindset that I'm trying to install within transit. So um, bus connections with ferries, we have been working on. I mean, we, I appreciate it's, it's the other end of the city, but we've just provided some extra bus connections to uh, the new ferry service in the Bronx. So certainly we, we should be looking at bus connections with ferries in south, uh, southwest Brooklyn. Um, in, in light with, of that, or consistent with that comment I made about philosophy, uh, we don't, we haven't used minibuses. I've asked my team, why don't we? Minibuses, or for that matter, midi buses, which is kind of a, a sort of a, a middle, a middle uh, sized bus, you know, say maybe 20 seater. Um, because particularly for local communities where the streets are very narrow or where the ridership wouldn't warrant a big bus, why wouldn't we look at some new technology? I think we need to be uh, fresh in our thinking. So again, that philosophy will be, um, we'll hear you out. And, and again, the, the, ferries, the, the, the ferries have offered an, another transportation route and that has impact on the, not just for connections, but for need. And one of the things that I feel, uh, let's stay on philosophy, what, what's your responsibility when we think about a project, another city project like the BQX? Mm -hmm. and, and this is, I think, an example of where the emperor has no clothes. I feel like the mayor just does not understand that this is a terrible project. And you have a specific role in really advancing, uh, I think, not only robust uh, visionary plan, mm -hmm. but is in conflict, I think, with this idea that no one likes except for developers and can have an impact, a negative impact on your plan if so much energy is going from the agencies into this into this plan that nobody likes except this person, this one singular person that happens to be the mayor of the city of New York. What's your role and responsibility in digesting that in the terms of the larger conversation about the future of Okay, so planning, I would say I'm, I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but I would say that my philosophy, role... Philosophy. Well, I know politics is philosophy, but help me understand what your role and responsibility philosophy is. Philosophy is mindset, and that's why I made the comment about philosophy. Philosophy, what I was talking about, was the prevailing mindset at uh, New York City Transit on my tenure will be a can-do approach and to consider new ideas. Uh, that's, I would respect, I'd say, that certainly my British definition is yeah. f uh, mindset is different from philosophy in, in, in the point that I'm making. Um, so I'm oh, sorry, different from uh, politics. So I'm not gonna get into the politics of it. I'm aware of the BQX. Uh, I'm crystal clear on my two biggest priorities. That is, uh, so those are, number one, to make the existing transit system work exponentially better for New Yorkers right here today, to make it, uh, to keep it safe, to make it work properly, uh, to, 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 dr to drive up, relentlessly drive up performance across all three modes, uh, paratrans, subways, and buses. Second key role is what we've been talking about today, to uh, create a plan for the future, uh, to, uh, to, to make a case for that future, and then if you give me the money to deliver on it. And what I'm telling you right now is that I'm aligned with your goals, except we have someone that is not. And I think we can work together on the philosophical and we'll stay away from the politics and really bring that, that nature that is uh, clear and can have positive impacts. And let's, let's do that together. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to, to, to take the, the mini, the midi bus concept and figure it out and what funding can come out of our budget negotiations to, to, to fund some of these things would be great for people that want some transit solutions. Uh, the last thing I wanna ask is the accessibility plan for 10 years includes some dots and nodes in Southwest Brooklyn mm -hmm. at 59th Street. Can you give us an update on the 59th Street elevator I'd, uh, plan? Mm -hmm. If you have that, and I'll, uh, I'll end there. To check that, 59. I have a lot of uh, stats to remember. Um, that would be that one, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, that is within 59th Street, 4th Avenue is within the 2015-2019 capital program. So that, that is happening. Uh, and we'll, we can get you an up-to-date uh, status report, more detailed status report offline.
great. We'll send that to you. Thank you so much. That'd be wonderful. Great news for the neighborhood. The neighborhood impacted. Yeah. Thank so you so much for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. It's a few questions. Then we will let you go. And thank you for your time. You're welcome. Uh, did the MTA already choose the new company who will be uh, designing the new payment system? Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, we are. Yep. The replacement of the metro car. Yes. So that's happening right now. That is a project that is being um, it's being executed as we speak. It it takes place over a three year uh, period uh, and sees the progressive replacement of metro card with a fit for purpose uh, smart card, which also means you'll be able to pay using your phone, uh, your credit card, just by tapping on a reader. When when will we see the initial use of the new technology? Okay, so the first uh, rollout uh, begins with a number of stations on the Lexington line. I'm just finding my notes on this. Uh, so the, uh, the Lexington line, uh, 16 stations on the Lex from 42nd uh, Grand Central down to Atlantic Avenue Barclay Center in Brooklyn. Uh, and also on local and express bus routes on Staten Island. So we're doing this in a phased manner. Uh, and then progressively, we will then roll out that technology at the remaining bus, uh, on the remaining bus services and all the vehicles, and at the remaining uh, subway stations. And what, what were the criteria for using, for choosing those stations? Um, I'd have to check that. I, 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 okay. And if there's not... Criteria. What do you mean by criteria? Well, uh, how those stations were chosen, like... I want to see my one my station being at 168 and Broadway. They in one trend that is the heavily used um, by the okay. resident, by patient, by student. Like, I'll take a punt at that. I can't claim to be an expert on on this specific okay. item. You know, I, I hope you I've come across as well briefed on this. Um, my understanding is that because. It's very hard, and I've, I've seen it done elsewhere, it's very hard to implement a brand new system, big bang, do it all at once. You've got to make sure that it works, and so you want to choose a couple of um, areas which are typical of, of um, the rest of the network, if you like, or indicative of the rest of the network, so that you can be certain the thing works properly before you roll it out everywhere. So by doing a number of subway stations on a busy line, you get... Um, plenty of usage, you get to, to find out what are the bugs, does it work properly, do people know how to use it, uh, is it intuitive, etc., etc. And clearly we had to choose somewhere, um, one of the uh, boroughs to, to trial the uh, validators on the buses and it just so happens we've chosen Staten Island. Um, I appreciate that's a bit of a general answer, I can find out more specifics and get them to you. Okay, so, and if there's any chance to add another station, I would like to suggest 168 and the one in C and A train mm -hmm. as a potential one if the opportunity is there. At the same time, I also want to bring to your attention that as we are working with you, Team Marino, and Team the rest for sharing the information to the residents of, of Northern Manhattan as the elevator, the new elevator will be built at 168. Usually, as usual, it's gonna be also inconvenience. We want to have the best system in place so that we bring alternative buses if that's possible. But most important, I hope that we don't lose, lose the opportunity to explore the possibility to put a ramp in the 168 mm -hmm. one station from the elevator to the stair. And, and I know that I have to follow the federal standard I know that the distance, the wide and the length had to be taken care, but for me, as a million dollars investment for the new elevators is what happened there, please, you know, real get your team, real engineer to look at the possibility to see, but at the same time, That's when true. that elevator, new elevator will be installed, if there's the opportunity also to install, I'm not asking for go deep to the stair. I heard the argument that there's a lot of rock that is difficult, it, it will be possible to say, now that we bring the new elevators, why to leave it only to the level of, you know, where the elevator is right now, when we can take it down mm -hmm. to the stair. And we deal with a station, as I say, you know, heavily used, a lot of people use and only resident 
doctors, uh, patients, and students. Mm -hmm. My only suggestion is at the local level, 181st, we have many buses, like seven buses, that they go from the Bronx to Manhattan. There's now one bus shelter in that area, in that corridor. And when you pass by, there's a lot of senior citizens that they use it. As you know, a lot of people, they move from Washington High, Northern Manhattan to the Bronx. And I hope, again, if you think and look at that as something at the local level to be addressed, mm -hmm. that's also very important. There's now like seven buses crossing to Manhattan from the Bronx. And no, no, not a single uh, block with the bus shelters. I think that it should be something that we should look at. It. Just as a general comment on that 168 uh, station, the uh, I mean, as a general comment, uh, where we've been doing these surveys to across uh, the whole of the network to see what needs to be done to make each individual station accessible, uh, we're certainly not closed-minded to ramps. Ramps are a uh, are an option in some cases, and um, the issue is the uh, is looking to see. Um, what space have you got available to, to make sure that, uh, obviously you don't want the ramp to be too steep, uh, so it depends how much space you've got available to, to, to provide a ramp that is compliant with ADA standards. Uh, that is a very difficult station because of the geographical uh, challenges it faces, but rest assured, I'm not going to be... Um, I'm not going to go to you and say it's impossible until I'm certain that that's the case. I would ask for independent analysis to make sure that we're not missing something. I has been in previous experience in, let's say, Dykeman Street when the elevator was installed there and missing the opportunity to say here we can work to have both elevators in both directions and even a certain opportunity like the uptown one train is in the, is in the street level you only would take for to work in agreement with the property owner and immediately you can ex put an exit in the uptown level there. So I see you as more, you know, uh, open to ideas and, mm -hmm. and, you know, we work in a culture way. So here we are, this is what we, the way we do business and we don't move from there. And here we are, the 168, heavily used. We bring in new elevators. People going, it's gonna be going through a lot of inconvenience from this period of time because it usually happen but we are trying to fix what is not working. The elevators have been broken, we need to put a new one. As we are making that big investment, let's address at the same time, with all the challenges that it take, how we can make that station, where the challenge is only from the elevator to the stair. Mm -hmm. That's what stop anyone that is at 168 in a wheelchair to be able to move from the stair to the elevator. So okay. please, I hope sure. that you can definitely look at that one. My, la my other thing is about the question related to a sex right. As I ask you on, uh, with the pilot EHL program and you explain how people, you know, EHL now is more popular. But my question is, uh, is the MTA still accepting new application for the pilot? Uh, not at the moment. We have a closed list of participants. Uh, but that's f f that's that's not uh, set in stone forever. Okay. We're, we're evaluating still our options going forward, and particularly uh, how we can fund the very obvious latent demand. Okay. And as part of the of the of the fast forward uh, plan, which I personally, my colleague, we supported, uh, uh, the decision was made by the New City Transit to expand the use of enforcement camera. Uh, uh, It now it was based on information that we have. It, now they've been installed in 16 rules. So is the MTA it, committed to continue using that tool of installing those cameras in the buses mm -hmm. and go beyond those 16 rules? Uh, yes, we we do believe that they're a very useful technology. They uh, certainly enable us to help enforce uh, compliance on bus lanes, so we would certainly would like to uh, see that explored and uh, further expanded. Okay. So we get Metro, another question, Metro North, coming from Winchester, Connecticut, and other places. One particular sample, we get to Marble Hill, and from Marble Hill, that would be a great opportunity for a rider to say, if I pay the same fare, I should be able to use a metronor 
and go to 125th, go to Midtown Day side. Has you guys been open to, or is the only possibility that we make some changes, that MTA makes some changes, that when a rider use the, M, the Metro North during the five board jurisdiction for the fare to be the same as the other Metro card that we pay right now? Um, well, I think we're always, um, we would always welcome proposals from elected officials about um, different fare products and different uh, 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 local arrangements in the way that we have in Brooklyn with the and Queens with the Atlantic ticket. So, um, if you've got a proposal, uh, Chairman, that you'd like to make, we'd certainly I'd, I'd have my experts have a look at it. So, with that, thank you, and I hope that we will continue working together. As I said before, in summary, the council you heard from the speaker before, we are committed. We are open to continue working with you. I personally will lead any initiative to make the voice loud and clear that the city should be open to, to increase the contribution as the state should do the same thing, but that money should be dedicated only to the MTA and that money should be only used for maintenance and repair, which I hope that in close, this is something that we agree that this plan is mainly focused on maintenance and repair, right? Uh, well, maintenance and repair, but also added capacity, increased capacity. So it's, um, it's, it absolutely is maintenance repair for state to good repair. But what fast forward does is leapfrog from the existing system to a modern system, which is exponentially more reliable and has way more capacity. That's the difference. Great. And you promised last time when we talk, I hope that we will continue working before and during the time that you serve here, we work together to have a one payment system so that when one payment, riders should be able to transfer from a bus to a ferry and for a bicycle. That's absolutely the plan. That, Thank that, you. That's exactly what's happening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Ellen Shannon, Paul Goebel, Annalyn Courtney. Please be sure that King uh, Marino, that there's someone from the MTA. Let's be sure that there's someone from the MTA who will stay here to also listen to the testimony with the rest of the panel. Yes. Any one of you, whoever go first, we put in the timing in two minutes, as usual. So it take longer, please summarize. But if, if it's under the two minutes, so the clock is on two minutes. See the microphone has been off. Is that it? No? Okay. Good morning, my name is Ellen Shannon. I'm the Associate Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA, which was established in New York State, in the New York State Legislature in 1981 and is the official voice of New York City Transit, Metro North and Long Island Railroad riders. The transit system we all rely on is severely stressed. To remain a world-class city, it is important more important than ever to have a reliable system that keeps trains and buses moving smoothly to their destinations. The transit network has yet to fully recover from the 2010 service and workforce cuts, let alone the damage sustained in 2012 from Superstorm Sandy. We cannot afford to let the transit system go any further backwards to the old days. It's time to move forward. 
Therefore, we appreciate the opportunity to discuss the steps necessary to improve the transit system and the merits of New York City Transit's fast forward plan. The timing is particularly revel relevant as the MTA is holding its fair hearings. While raising the fare will help with the budget cap, substantially more funding is needed to set it in the, on the right path. We recognize that New York City and the state stepped up to fund the subway action plan and subway performance has improved or stabilized. But it is the fast forward plan which goes much further in addressing the system's needs and it's critical that it be fully funded. The magnitude of the problem that has occurred from decades of insufficient funding is simply larger than a one-shot approach. The answer must be in finding recurring and sustainable funding, but not only from congestion pricing, as that's not enough. Restoring and improving the subway system requires a bold new way of thinking accompanied by increased commitment of resources. Some of those resources must come from places like Amazon, which attracted, are attracted to the city partially due to the vast transportation network. Long Island City would greatly benefit from such investments. More people will mean more congestion in stations that are sorely in need of repair and upgrade. Similarly, there is great opportunity in capturing and adding value that transit brings from many real estate developments, and we strongly support all efforts in this area. It's also important that everyone pay their fair share. Um, fair beating costs the system hundreds of millions of dollars and putting added pressure on fares and service hurts all New Yorkers. The MTA needs also to focus on reducing waste and inefficiencies. We believe important light was shed on the topic through the two board working groups on procurement and contracting. We encourage all council members to look at the June MTA board meeting where presentations on these two topics and actions being taken were provided by commissioners Scott Reckler and Charles Merdler. But a ship as large as the MTA does not turn on a dime. That work is ongoing and is integral to gaining public trust. At the end of the day, it is in the interest of both the city and state to ensure that the system functions well and that it is appropriately funded. We cannot afford to wait decades for modernization efforts such as improved signal system to be completed and must find ways to accelerate them, which is what's laid out in the fast forward plan. Subway and bus riders need the city and MTA to work as partners so that the transportation system remains the lifeblood of the region. We look forward to a vigorous discussion of what needs to be done and how to pay for it and encourage the members of the City Council and this committee to fully participate in this dialogue. The Fast Forward Plan cannot be implemented without the state and the city's financial support and commitment. We look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Paul Goble and I'm the Transportation Policy Analyst for Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Thank you Chair Rodriguez for, and members of the Transportation Committee for holding this crucial hearing. President Byford's fast forward plan calls for sweeping and long awaited changes to overhaul our public transit system through accelerated modernization of our subway signal system, an increase in accessible subway stations and the redesigning of our bus routes. My office is excited about the results President Byford has promised and believes the first funding source we must tap into is congestion pricing. The question that many New Yorkers share is not if the work is needed, but if the MTA can be trusted to, to, to do it within reasonable budgets and sensible time frames. While President Byford's plan is justifiably ambitious, we must look at past MTA work to see the full picture. And past MTA work, specifically the installation of CBTC on the 7 train, does not show promising results. Research from the good government nonprofit reInvent Albany shows that the MTA exceeded its projected timeline for the project by five years and its projected budget by $157 million. Moreover, in a study my office requested from our city's independent budget office, they found that of the 33 signal related projects in MTA capital plans since 2005, 19 of them were delayed. A core tenet of the fast forward plan, and a major source of which city funding would be dedicated toward, is the installation of CBTC on the majority of our subway lines. 
Given the MTA's difficulties in delivering CBTC to just the seven line, I would like to echo the calls of Reba and Albany for President Byford to release an analysis of the seven train project and present it to city legislators. Specifically, the analysis should look at how the project exceeded its projected costs and timeline and how the MTA will avoid these same mistakes during future installations. For the city to provide a substantial share of the 40 billion required to modernize our transit system, we must be absolutely sure that its funds will be spent wisely. Lastly, as some of you may already be aware, my office has been disappointed in the MTA's recent decision to renege on their promise to upgrade two or three more SBS routes a year, and specifically to, de to defer the upgrade of the M96 from 2019 to as late as 2023. The MTA's stated reasons for SBS deferral, budget constraints, and borough-wide redesigns do not apply to the M96. The shortness of the route makes it inexpensive to upgrade and unlikely to change under a bus route redesign. The reality is that not every upgrade and service must, co must cost $40 billion. In the case of the M96, the upgrade would only cost $1.8 million. The M96 and its 14,000 daily riders deserve to benefit from the results seen on other SBS routes. Specifically for the M79, which happened over just a year ago, riders saw an 8% 8, 8 decrease in travel time and a 9% decrease, decrease in ridership. As ridership decreases have been a problem for the MTA's finances, this projected increase for the M96 should be of keen interest to us all. In the end, while the fast forward plan promises fantastic results, we must look realistically at past MTA outcomes in deciding how, how to allocate potential city funding and the changes we need to ask for to ensure funding is spent well. President Byford should present the city with plans as to how the MTA will avoid the pitfalls involved in the seven train CBTC installation and he should agree to upgrade the M96 to SBS in 2019 as was, as was originally planned in, in order to show how the MTA will sensibly spend potential city funding for the fast forward plan. Thank you. My name is Anna Lynn Courtney. I'm an orientation and mobility instructor at Vision Services for the Blind and I'm gonna ask for just one thing. When the subways are being made accessible, the accessibility feature that a lot of blind people would like is to know how to find the conductor's booth or the conductor's car. And the best way to do that is by putting down a tactile guideway across the subway platform perpendicular to the tracks. Um, at Visions, we've worked with DOT testing. Our consumers and our instructors have tested some of the tactile guideways they use. And as you're sitting there thinking, what is the cost benefit? How many blind people versus how much these, these guideways will cost? Consider that the truncated domes on the sides of the platforms keep everybody away from the edge and a tactile guideway in telling you where the conductor can be found would help everyone. It would help people who want the safety of riding in the car with an MTA employee. It would help people who want information. So that's what I'm asking for. So my, what I can say to all of you is that we're looking to continue working together. You know, this conversation never stops. And this is about the level of advocacy that we have to continue doing. It never, that's what we choose to do. And it doesn't matter if the role is from this side or from your side. It, our city deserves to have our transportation system to the 21st century. Taking workers, middle class, upper class time to whatever destination they have. And as I said before, I hope that we can continue advocating to stop one any fear, any fear hike, to make it all the station accessible, and also to be sure that the MTA will have all the resources and with a plan to control the cost. So with that, thank you. Now we call in the next panel. Monica Bartley, Susan Duha, Valerie Joseph, Yesenia Torres, and Kate Slevin.
Good afternoon, I'm Kate Slevin, Senior Vice President um, at Regional Plan Association. I'm here today representing RPA along with the Fix Our Transit Coalition, which is a coalition of over 100 civic, business, industry, environmental, community, labor, and social justice organizations from across the region that are working together to build public and political support for new state funding for transit with congestion pricing as its linchpin. But now you've heard all the benefits of the fast forward plan um, for more and faster subway and bus service, including transitioning the fleet to electric buses, to more elevators, enhanced customer service, and better project delivery at the MTA. Our groups, many of whom are often critical of the MTA, strongly believe fast forward is credible and doable and is the right plan to modernize the city's transit system. The fast forward plan is also a roadmap to modernizing New York City transit to, it, to allow, it, allow it to deliver the kind of high quality service that befits a region that is powered by transit and the millions of riders who want and deserve better. This is why all these organizations have come together to push for congestion pricing in order to implement the proposals in fast forward. We believe congestion pricing is equitable and a realistic choice to get the system moving again. We have had over 100 meetings with community organizations and elected officials over the past six months, and we can attest that this support for Fast Forward extends far beyond our organizations. And when you looked at the statistics, you will see why. Transit delays and unreliability are forcing New Yorkers to pay more to get around, either with their pocketbooks or with their time. For example, the growth in very long commutes is particularly upsetting. For example, in the Bronx, the number of people commuting more than an hour to work has grown from nearly 34% in 2010 to nearly 38% in 2017. A transit system in decline drags down our region's economy, threatens the livelihoods of individuals and small businesses, and damages the health and quality of life of everyone who lives or works in the MTA 12 county service area. It threatens to increase transportation emissions at a time when we need to be doing everything we can to aggressively cut pollution. These delays hurt those who are most reliant on subways and buses and those who cannot or who are unable to own cars. Nearly 60% of low-income New Yorkers from the outer boroughs depend on transit to get to work. In fact, less than 2% of low-income commuters from the outer boroughs would regularly face the new congestion charge. Nearly 40, 40 times as many low-income New Yorkers will benefit from improved transit that congestion pricing revenues would bring. All drivers will benefit from less traffic inside and outside the central business district. Any new proposal for funding fast forward will be controversial and challenging to implement, but we have to get it done. We thank the council, especially Mem Count, um, council member Rodriguez for his leadership in supporting congestion pricing as a way to fund fast forward. And we urge you to continue to be a strong advocate and work with your state colleagues to get this done in 2019. Congestion pricing won't fix all of our problems, but it is the cornerstone of any long-term plan to shift course and create a fairer, more sustainable city. To learn more about Fix Our Transit, go to fixourtransit.org. Thank, Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Monica Bartley, Community Outreach Organizer at the Center for Independence of the Disabled New York, Sydney and I am representing Susan Duha. Thank you, Councilmember Rodriguez, for the opportunity to testify in relation to the plan to fix New York City's mass transit system fast forward. As you may know, the Center for Independence of the Disabled is a plaintiff in two lawsuits seeking to remedy the inaccessibility of the subway system and ensure that the accessible features of the subway system are maintained. We believe that we may not be assured of reaching full accessibility without a binding and enforceable commitment. We believe that the time has come for the MTA to acknowledge that it has for years violated the civil rights of people with disabilities and that the time has come for the court to compel them to change. New York City human rights law makes it unlawful to deny people with disabilities full and equal enjoyment on equal terms and conditions of public accommodations. Nonetheless, the subways are, according to former MTA chairman and CEO Prendergast, the most efficient way to get around town. 
However, according to the American Community Survey, 41% of people with no disability use the subway to get to work, whereas only 7% of people with mobility disabilities use the subway. Inability to reliably use the subway impedes the employment, access to education, healthcare, community participation, worship, and completion of simple errands. Even if the accessibility goals of fast forward were met and the current legal obligations to produce 17 more stations plus an additional 50 stations plus another 130 stations were reached, then only 65% of the subway system would be made accessible. This would be a gain but would leave New York City behind other major cities in the United States, including San Francisco, Washington DC, Boston, Philadelphia, and Chicago. The MTA insists that it must receive funds for its four equal priorities before it will commit to the accessibility goals. However, in the 1982 EPVA versus MTA elevator case, the settlement agreement requiring installation of elevators preceded the state allocation of capital funding to complete the work. We believe that it is time to acknowledge that remedying these civil rights violations is the first priority and that the MTA make a detailed and enforceable agreement to do so in a timely way. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Valerie Joseph, and this is my colleague, Yesenia Torres. We are here from BCID. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the MTA New York City Transit's Fast Forward MTA plan. We represent the Brooklyn Center for the Independence of the Disabled, an advocate for people with disabilities for more than six decades. For the people with disabilities, the Fast Forward plan is unprecedented. For the first time, the MTA makes a commitment to accessibility and calls it one of its four equal priorities, along with transforming the subway, a reimagination of the buses, and empowering the MTA employees. Fast Forward also outlines an inhibition program of improvements from a rapid expansion of the number of subway elevators to an improved accessoride system to better communication. These new commitments are welcome and long overdue, but we want more than a few pages in a 74-page document. After all, we know the MTA's history far too well. Fierce legal battles to make buses and 100% subway station accessible in the 1970s and the 1980s. Lawsuits in the 1990s to get the MTA to adhere federal law for accessoride, major cutbacks in bus service in 2010, no commitment to adding elevators after 2020, no innovation in accessoride service until last year. It is a sorry record, and we, we've learned our lesson. For the first two fast forward promises we'll, we'll discuss, we call on President Byford and the MTA to settle subway access lawsuits from the disability community, including BCID. We know that while funding from state and city officers is essential, only a legal settlement will guarantee and will have us get us our success. Continuing the testimony, um, I'm gonna bring out like bullet um, of information uh, that we're very interested in, in bringing about. It says subway station accessibility. BCID has joined several other disability groups in a state lawsuit charging the MTA 
in violating New York City human rights law because of the lack of accessible stations. Only 24% of the systems, 472 stations are accessible. For the two of us, and for more than 200,000 Brooklynites, this is a basic civil right question. If stations don't have elevators, we cannot travel in our city's vast subway systems. That's just wrong. Fast Forward commits to 50 new elevators and a fully <coughs> accessible system must be backed by a legal agreement in elevator maintenance. We've also sued the MTA over its poor maintenance of the subway elevators. We both encounter out of service elevators and even had to be carried out of one station. The elevators are often dirty beyond relief. Fast forward promise to make elevators more reliable, but only a legal settlement will keep the authority honest. On bus redesign, the MTA buses are the slowest in the nation, according to the fast forward, who could argue. We support always ways of giving buses priority in traffic. The installation of 150 audio capable bus signs, better bus lanes, enforcement, and other improvements. But we are concerned about the plan to re, the plan to re, re, rationalize bus stops, which is transit speak for reducing the number of stops. The MTA must reconsider this priority since stops that are further apart are likely to make bus rides harder for people with disabilities. In addition, the MTA and the city DOT must make the placements of bus benches at every bus stop. On Accessoride, BCID is the core member of the Accessoride Reform Group, or more known as ARG, thinking of frustration. But both Accessoride uh, can tell you that they're nothing like being stranded at 2 a.m. in the morning because of a bad service. Under pressure from our groups and many other riders, the MTA has finally begun to make fixes. For example, most accessible ride riders must call for a ride a day in advance, which no other MTA rider needs to do. But the MTA starts, started a on-demand pilot program a year ago, which has been life transforming for the 1,200 lucky participants for the first time. Accessor ride can travel around the town with little or no notice, just like any other riders. Finally, we have to work closely with the MTA to get a, a accessor ride rider vehicles permission to use bus lanes so far. The DOT has agreed only to let about 800 dedicated accessor ride vehicles in the lanes, but there are still a thousand more dedicated vehicles that should have the right as well. I have also testimony on behalf of the United Spinal Association, and I have the copies if you would like, or I could read it for them. Then the, the sergeant here will take them. Okay, give so. It to the sergeant and he will pass it to us. Okay, so should I read it for them? Just give it to him. Okay, and put it in the beautiful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, and with that, I got to say that your fight is our fight. Uh, you're fighting only for the 900,000 New Yorkers who need a better, more accessibility in our stations. But it's a fight for parents who they need a accessibility when they are carrying the kids with a stroller. It's a fight for senior citizens. It's our fight. Because at some point, all of us, we need to rely in a accessible station. So thank you, and we will continue working together. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. thank you. Next, we have Jackie Cohen, Liam Blank, Chris Pangilinan, Colin Wright, and Jack Davies.
Um, Good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez and the committee. I'm Jackie Cohen, campaign director for the Night Park Strap Hangers campaign, and I'm here representing the Bus Turnaround Coalition, which also includes the Riders Alliance, Transit Center, and Tri-State Transportation campaign, and I'm joined uh, to deliver testimony with my colleague Liam Blank from Tri-State. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to offer feedback on the city's role in making MTA's fast forward plan a success for New York's eight million daily transit riders. Now in short, the city's role in Fast Forward is to fix bus service. MTA buses operate on city streets. Buses serve every city neighborhood. The city needs to prioritize the more than two million New Yorkers who ride MTA buses each day. Bus riders are more likely to be elderly, immigrants, people of color, and lower income than subway riders and New Yorkers at large. Improving bus service is essential to enhancing economic opportunity and promoting social inclusion. It isn't just a matter of efficiency, it's a progressive imperative. It's impossible for New York to become the fairest city in the country, as Mayor de Blasio has promised, without better bus service. So now I'm going to turn over to my colleague Liam Blank, who will elaborate on the specific steps our city must take to improve bus service and help ensure the success of Fast Forward mov um, moving on. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and committee members. Uh, I'm Liam Blank, Advocacy and Policy Manager for Tri-State Transportation Campaign. Last July, the Bus Turnaround Coalition released Fast Bus, Fair City, a proposed complement to the MTA's Fast Forward Plan that highlights exactly what the city needs to do to improve bus service. Fast Bus, Fair City calls for 100 new dedicated bus lane miles in the next five years, including 60 new miles during the de Blasio administration. We call for a rapid expansion in transit signal priority to all applicable bus routes, and we also call for bus shelters at every bus stop and automated bus lane enforcement. We urge you to join us in pushing the administration toward adopting this bold progressive plan to improve bus service. With the council's help, we look forward to the creation and implementation of a citywide approach to improving the bus network so riders can finally have fast, efficient, and reliable service. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez and members of the New York City Council Transportation Committee for the opportunity to testify in support of Fast Forward this morning. Uh, I'm Colin Wright, Advocacy Associate at Transit Center, and I'm joined by my colleague Chris Pangalinen, Program Director at Transit Center. Uh, Transit Center is a research and advocacy foundation dedicated to improving public transportation in New York City and in cities across the United States. Our position as a national organization lends us a broad perspective on what makes transit succeed or fail in cities. We find that transit is best served when city leadership is a partner uh, with its transit agency in providing the tools it needs to flourish, along with the oversight necessary to keep the public agency accountable to the public. That's why we're pleased the City Council is conducting a hearing on the Fast Forward Plan. If funded, and if funded and implemented, the Fast Forward Plan would run more trains on crowded subway lines, replace aging subway cars, reorganize the city's vast bus network, and install hundreds of elevators at inaccessible stations. These are critically important improvements that will help riders' everyday commutes. Our subway and buses are foundational to life in New York City, yet they are crumbling under decades of mismanagement and underfunding. Trains are delayed, buses are stuck in traffic, and riders are at the end of their ropes. We ask the New York City Council to partner with the state to make sure the Fast Forward Plan becomes reality. The city has not only the opportunity, but also the obligation to make sure New York's subways and buses serve your constituents. New York won't continue to prosper unless the state and city leaders do their part to fix our transit network. Further, as stewards of the public's money and trust, it's incumbent upon this council to stand up for riders by asking the MTA to take steps toward reform by, for example, reining in exorbitant costs and reforming archaic uh, procurement rules. Indeed, getting agency costs under control is the only way we can afford to restore and expand our transit network on the scale necessary today. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Pangalinen uh, with Transit Center, and as Colin said, uh, we're here to testify in support of New York, City's transit, uh, New York City Transit's Fast Forward commitment to install elevators at hundreds of subway stations around the city. Um, hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers require elevators to access the subway every day. People with disabilities like myself and our friends in the audience here, parents pushing strollers and travelers carrying luggage, uh, as well as residents suffering from injuries. Uh, today, however, 
New York City Transit operates the least accessible subway system in the country. Um, and nearly 30 years after the passage of the Americans with Disability Act in 1990, only a quarter of the city subway, elevators, uh, city subway stations have elevators. Uh, and even when they have elevators, these, these break down often, rendering even the few stations accessible for those with mobility needs. And during the most recent quarter, New York City Transit elevator data shows that 255 elevators in the subway system experienced over 4,000 outages. Now, what does this actually mean? And what I want to do is just relate this on a more personal level. And what this really means is that for me and for people with disabilities, it means that we're missing out on vast swaths of this city, being unable to go to parts in Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and the Bronx, um, and, be, and unfortunately missing out on events such as birthday parties, uh, employment opportunities, and, and places we can live. Um, and really what this is, is uh, when it comes down to it, is it means we're being excluded from the very fabric of, of New York life that nearly everyone in this room um, takes for granted. But all New Yorkers, including those with disabilities, deserves to be included in. And what's exciting is that the Fast Forward Plan aims to correct these injustices. It commits a clear timeline for station accessibility, uh, installing 50 stations in the next five-year capital program with the goal of achieving maximum accessibility in the next 15 years. This plan will put New York in league with our peers in Boston and Chicago, which are also two century old systems that nevertheless have more than twice the station accessibility of New York, and also have realistic plans to reach 100%. The fast forward commitment promises that instead of lagging behind these other cities, we will actually help set the pace. Um, so, but to give us the best chance at system accessibility, the fast forward plan must be fully funded. And history shows that in a competition among many priorities, station elevators lose every time. And this is why we have so few today. The city has an obligation to correct this long-standing injustice for transit accessibility where it can. In exchange for whatever tools our resources, uh, the city provides the MTA, you have the prerogative to demand accountability from this agency. Fast forward ensures that every New Yorker will finally be able to access all that make our remarkable city has to offer. And let's make this plan a reality. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for convening the hearing for the chance to testify. My name is Jack Davies. I'm the Policy and Campaigns Manager for Transportation Alternatives. Our transportation, transportation system is in a state of crisis. Cuts to basic upkeep have crippled the subway and bus networks. Delays in the subway have tripled. Over the last five years, subway stations are crumbling to pieces, and aging trains and signal systems can't keep up with growing ridership. But we now have a golden chance to comprehensively alleviate this crisis by enacting the fast forward plan. But this plan is inseparable from congestion pricing. It's the only realistic solution to fairly and sustainably raising the majority of the billions needed to fund fast forward. We must make fixing the subway and congestion pricing our city's first priority this year. New Yorkers simply cannot afford to wait to see action on a serious plan to fix our subways and tame the region's traffic. Under congestion pricing, everyone will contribute something to fixing New York City's broken transit network, and everyone will get something in return. It prioritizes the fundamental needs of a vast majority of regular New Yorkers, particularly lower income workers, outer borough residents, and seniors who rely on public transit. The complexity of planning for New York City's future requires bold action. New Yorkers deserve better than crippling traffic and unreliable public transit and across the five boroughs. They're ready to support fast forward and congestion pricing and return our city to its rightful place as the worldwide leader in transportation equity, sustainability, and safety. Thank you. Thank you. I got to say that in this group here and many ally, we have the voice of the voiceless. You know, we have probably one of the city, even though we have the biggest challenges to make our stations accessible, I think that we also have in this city, and you represent with your the members of the institution that you've been organizing tirelessly in the last couple of months and, and couple of years, the hope that we have to turn our transportation system to the 21st century. So I think that the moment is now. The crisis reached a point that there's not turn back. It's not only the 8.5 million residents who we are, but it's the 65 million visitors that they come from London, they come from Shanghai, they come from Tokyo, and they come and they compare. And as we have a lot of bandsmen in different places, when it comes to 
transportation is one of those where I personally would like you know, to continue working, being your partner as a voice here to be sure that transportation is the centerpiece of any policy that we put in place because it affects the life of everyone. You know, I remember having my two daughters, you know, relying on the elevator as if now there was an elevator, you know, here I had to be relying on someone that helped me with the solar. Same reality is that 100,000 of people, they live in our city every week. So as, as I say, when we advocated to make all the station accessible, it's not only for the 900,000 individuals who live a productive life, who rely in the wheelchair to go to work, to visit their friends, to go to the museums. It's for the parents. It's for the senior citizens. It's for myself who in the future, it doesn't matter, it's a matter of time, I also will rely on the station with the elevator. And we fought together to, for fair fair. We know that it, we also have a city that still has a lot of transportation deserts. Many schools, they're missing to attract good teachers because sometimes during the winter season, how someone that would like to make a difference would choose between a school from where they had to walk 10, 15 blocks from the train station or a school that is like two, three blocks from there. So uh, thank you for your partnership and we will continue together until we turn our system to a 21st century one. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. But before, I would like to thank the great team and staff that we have, Jane uh, from and the council, Jane Di Giovanni, our council, Emily Rooney, senior policy, Rick Aello, policy analyst, Shima, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Oshibit, Oshiger, who is a financial analyst, and John Basile, financial analyst. And I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses right now. Thank you. With that, this hearing is adjourned.